So in the grim darkness of the far future of the Warhammer 40k universe, there's a whole load of factions and armies to choose from, and it can be a bit overwhelming for newer players trying to get into the game. In this video, let's talk through every single army from Mighty Space Marines, Twisted Demons, and Alien Civilizations, and talk through some of the finer points of the faction's lore, miniature range, cost to put on the tabletop, and how they play in-game in Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Before we jump into going through faction by faction though, I would bear in mind the general advice of the community is usually just to play one that you like, and often the model style, looks, lore and background of the faction are what really make people love an army in Warhammer 40k, perhaps a little bit more so than the rules and games mechanics, and certainly the faction's power in game, which changes really quite frequently. Other factors can be the price of the models that you're collecting, which absolutely does vary faction to faction, and some people might be specifically looking for smaller and easier to manage armies, maybe just a few big models or elite troops to paint up, as opposed to hordes of infantry figures which might take a lot longer, though of course plenty of people enjoy that too. If you're starting out, I'd probably pick up the army's codex to read, if your faction's book is out at the moment at least, or maybe try dipping your toe in the army with a box of basic troops or something, paint up a few and see how you like them. As mentioned, there's a whole ton of factions out there in Warhammer 40k, and they're broadly broken down into three different sections, the armies of the Imperium, of Humanity and Mankind, the followers of the Dark Gods of Chaos, the Space Marine Traitor Legions, the Demons themselves, and the Chaos Knights, and the Alien Forces of Xenos, many radically different alien empires and horrors out there, all seeking to conquer the stars for themselves. This is the rough breakdown of the Imperial armies, for the Space Marines, there's six slightly more normal chapters, adherent to the Codex Astartes, five more divergent chapters, the Dark Angels, Blood Angels, Death Watch, Space Wolves and Black Templars, and Grey Knights, who are perhaps the most divergent, the elite force of Demon Hunters operating out of Titan. Otherwise, there's the Nuns with Guns, the Adeptus Auroritus, the creepily cybernetically augmented Adeptus Mechanicus, guarding the Forge Worlds of the Imperium, the hard-bitten Imperial Guard, the Astra Militarum, representing the common human fighting against the aliens of Horus, the superhuman guards of the Empire, the Adeptus Custodes, like Trajan Valoris here, as superior to a normal space marine as a normal space marine is to a human, the Imperial Knight households of super-heavy walkers, and various Imperial agents such as Inquisition, Assassins, and Rogue Traders. For the Force of Chaos, we have the Chaos Space Marines, the heretics who turn their backs on the Emperor during the Horus Heresy, and they have various sub-armies, Death Guard, Thousand Sons, and World Eaters, each specifically devoted to one Chaos Deity with all their quirks and fighting styles. There are the Chaos Demons, the physical manifestations of the Dark Gods, and the Chaos Knights, the Imperial ones that have fallen to Chaos and now reap bloody destruction across the Imperium. Finally, for the aliens classified under Xenos, there are the Space Elf Eldari, plying the void in their craft worlds, the Harlequin Performers and the Death God Worshippers of the Inari both included here. Their Dark Kin are the piratical raiders of the Drukhari, making war to raid, steal and enslave. From beyond the galaxy, the all-consuming swarms of the Tyranids move in, with gene stealer cults infiltrating ahead of them to tell the coming of their Star Gods and undermine the planet's resistance. The Young Tau Empire fight with new technology and alien battlesuits. The Leagues of Votan are a cloned race of dwarf warriors, also high technology and fighting with AI augmentation within their ranks. The alien orcs love a good scrap, and hurling themselves headlong into conflict, and the undead living metal forces of the Necrons rise from the tomb world to take back the empire that once was theirs. As you can probably tell, there's really quite a lot of stuff going on in the 41st millennium, so let's go through all these armies one by one, and we'll start with the Space Marines. The Space Marines are pretty much the poster boys of Warhammer 40k. Genetically engineered super soldiers and some of humanity's best troops, and fight against the many horrors that beset the Imperium, clad in mighty suits of power armor, wielding brutal chainswords, and firing off shells with their bolt weapons that fire many explosive shells at the enemy. Much of the entire 40k setting is really focused around the Space Marines and their exploits in the stars, from the Horus Heresy to the present day setting, and they're organized into their own unique chapters, each of which are sort of monastic knightly organizations with their own heraldry, fighting styles, and usually grave flaws of one sort or another. We'll talk through the chapters in a bit more detail shortly, but here are some of the ones you'd consider some of the more standard chapters of Space Marines, following the Primarch Rebute Gilliman's Codex Astartes quite religiously. They very much go in for bright heraldry, and tend to specialize in shock tactics, making war in punchy and aggressive strikes to utterly destroy the enemy army. Space Marines being thoroughly iconic to the setting have a frankly enormous miniature range, 
far more minutes to support than any other faction in the game, which is definitely a positive. On top of that, the majority of their range has been redone recently, as Games Workshop transitioned from the firstborn Space Marines to the new and slightly upscaled Primaris Marines. Even though they've been phasing out quite a lot of the older Space Marine kits, quite a bit of old stuff still remains, plenty of tanks and vehicles and things, and also a bunch of the sub-faction specific Space Marine miniatures can be kind of dated. If I was starting collecting Space Marines, I'd certainly skew my purchases a lot more towards the primary side of things, more so than the firstborn miniatures, as it seems kind of likely at this point that Games Workshop is going to slowly phase the latter out. For some examples of Space Marine miniatures, this guy on the right here is a Space Marine Intercessor, a basic power arm trooper wielding the nonetheless mighty bolt rifle, pretty much the mainstay of their battle line. Here for a couple of vehicles we have the Redemptor Dreadnought and the Hovering Repulsor Executioner, both slightly more recent innovations in their army. Dreadnoughts are a rather sinister space marine contraption where an injured warrior can be kept alive indefinitely to fight for the chapter as long as they can last, whereas this Repulsor Executioner sports a fearsome laser destroyer, the bane of enemy vehicles in game. The Space Marines have also had two of their Loyalist Primarchs return to the battle as well. This is Rebute Gilliman wielding the Emperor's Sword. The Primarch of the Ultramarines returned from grievous wounds and serves as Lord Commander of the entire Imperium at the moment. Price-wise, at least for Warhammer miniatures, Space Marines tend to be a little bit more forgiving on the wallet than some. Being an elite army means that you don't necessarily need loads of them, and they tend to be some of the most frequent receivers of bundle discount boxes. Their miniatures appear in the core 40k starter sets, and between all the divergent chapter options, they've got a lot of choices for combat patrol box sets, most of which can be used quite well for standard Space Marines. The Marines here on the right are the contents of the Space Marine half of the Leviathan box set, which you might still be able to find in some places. Games Workshop's launch set for 10th edition was an unusually good deal, both for Space Marines and Tyranids, and this is just one half of the box. In game, with quite such a massive array of options open to them, Space Marines can manage to fill most playstyles quite well, some of which are rather exemplified by the more divergent chapters, which we'll get onto in a second. The core rules are found in Codex Space Marines for 10th edition currently, and they have index supplements for those more divergent chapters should you choose to play one of those. And the core Space Marine rule that they all get is Oath of Moment, choosing one enemy unit and getting reroll hits against that unit, basically the chapter marking one target that they want to destroy and taking it out with extreme prejudice. Within the core Codex Space Marines, they have the choice of seven different detachments, a first company task force for their more veteran and terminator armoured units, and then the other six detachments are very loosely themed around the fighting style of one of the chapters, say for example there's the Stormlance task force of the White Scars that focuses on close assault and mounted units, or the Iron Storm spearhead of the Iron Hands, which focuses around heavy firepower often delivered by vehicles and dreadnoughts. In 10th edition though it's quite nice that any one chapter can play any one of these detachments to represent that chapters might make war in different ways given the different circumstances. As mentioned, Space Marines big range means they can do most things really quite well. You can have guerrilla warfare forces, say with Phobos Marines and the Vanguard detachment, close assault forces, heavy firepower off vehicles and tanks and things, or a big mix of all of the above if that would make sense. The only thing they don't tend to do so much is lots of cheap infantry as they tend to be quite elite, so they don't really do horde style units. Currently in game they're kind of medium power right now, certainly a bit dependent on the chapter and detachment that you pick, but definitely do have the potential to be strong. Finally for the core space marines, let's just take a quick look through the major chapters, all of which have at least one unique miniature of their own. Starting off, we've got the Blue Armoured Ultramarines, sort of Romanesque themes with them, and fighting a very tactically balanced style, guarding their realm of Ultramar. They're the Legion and Chapter of Reboot A. Gilliman, and tend to be the poster boys of Warhammer 40k in general, really. They've got a bigger cast of characters than any of the rest of the less divergent chapters here. The Ferocious White Scars are fast and brutal with a liking for bikes, which they sort of see as their armoured steeds. They've got a lot of Mongolian themes in their army, and got one unique miniature in Corsair Khan here a head taker champion who specialises in killing the enemy characters in game. The Raven Guard tend to specialise in stealth warfare and tactics, striking from the shadows, often with Phobos marines or jump infantry, assassinating enemy characters before slipping back to the shadows before the enemy can retaliate. Kayvan Shrike is their chapter master and unique miniature, fighting with a jump pack and paired lightning claws, and he shrouds his squad in shadows to prevent them from being shot by enemy heavy guns in game. The Dower Iron Hands believe that the flesh is weak and tend to make great use of bionic augmentations to make their warriors stronger and tougher. 
They bring heavy firepower with big vehicles and dreadnoughts, and have a unique miniature of Iron Father Phyros, essentially a gravis armoured tech marine who makes his squad tougher with his rights of tempering. The Salamanders are the sons of the Perpetual Vulcan, and like their draconic forefather, they exemplify raw might and toughness, and have a preference for utterly immolating their foe with melter and flamer weapons, crafted by their superlative artificers. They've got a couple of character miniatures in Adrax Agatone here and Vulcan Heston. Adrax is a monstrously scary combatant with the Malleus Nocturne there, very nasty with a squad of Blade Guard veterans if they can close with the foe. Finally we've got the Imperial Fists, the bolter-wielding Sentinels of Terror, specialists in defensive tactics and siege warfare. They tend to fight more at range than in close combat, and again have a couple of unique miniatures in Tor Garadon and Darnath Lysander. Tor Garadon is utterly brutal in melee with that enormous power fist of his to put the smack down on enemy vehicles and fortifications. Moving on to the more divergent Space Marine chapters now, these are the ones that do things a bit more radically different to their standard Battle Brothers, and Games Workshop have made these into miniature armies of their own right, using most of the core choices that the standard Space Marines can get, but getting other exciting stuff on top of that. The Dark Angels are first here, as is their right of the First Legion. They very much exemplify the monastic and knightly tone of Space Marines, a very secretive order that are constantly trying to guard the fall that their legion had during the Horus Heresy, where a large portion of their legion fell to chaos. And since then, they've been hunting down the remnants ever since, their black clad raven wing bike formations hunting down the fugitives before the hammer of the bone coloured death wing terminators brings them to justice. They make war under the command of Chapter Master Azrael from the great battle fortress that is the Rock, though now Primarch Lionel Johnson has been recently reunited to them the fortunes and focus of the chapter might change significantly. The Dark Angels have really quite a big miniature range. On the left here is Lionel Johnson, Chapter Master Azrael is here in the centre, and Master Lazarus is on the right. Many of their miniatures are accompanied by the miniature eldritch horrors that are the Watchers in the Dark, Mysterious Guardians, Shrouded in Capes. Otherwise, most of the rest of their unique miniatures are for the Deathwing and Ravenwing, here on the left we have some Deathwing Knights armed with their Maces of Redemption, a particularly scary Space Marine Terminator force there, and on the right we have a Ravenwing Command Squad of Vikers and a Nephilim Jet Fighter flying above. There's a good chance that quite a few of their Deathwing and Ravenwing miniatures will probably get updates in 2024 when their Codex comes out. In game a lot of their unique units are interesting, maybe Chapter Master Azrael and the Deathwing Knights are particularly standout unique units for them, Lionel Johnson definitely has a lot of his own personal might as well, and they do get access to a detachment that the rest of the Space Marines don't in the Unforgiven Task Force. The stratagems and things that you can get for it are quite good, though the core benefit is a bit of a weird one, basically making the Space Marines a bit better at taking objectives, even if they fail morale tests. At time of recording for in-game strength, I feel like their unique units do add a lot, and seem to be doing quite well at tournaments with them, but usually it's with other detachments that isn't their Unforgiven Task Force one as it maybe just doesn't really add all that much for them. In any case, if you want to collect an army of secretive monastic knightly space marines in deep green power armour, then the Dark Angels might be for you. Next up, for another flavour of knightly space marines, we have the Black Templars. They're a vast splintered chapter that's an offshoot of the Imperial Fist originally, under the initial direction of Sigismund, and they're basically a chapter that exemplifies the Crusading Knight. They operate out of Crusade fleets that are constantly purging their way across the galaxy, resupplying and recruiting as they go, and driving Xenos, Chaos and Heretic in front of them, put to death by Bolter, Chainsword and Flamer. In battle they tend to deploy large squads of Chainsword wielding Space Marines, like this Crusader squad that you can see on the right here, the new recruit Space Marine neophytes being trained up on the battlefield by their initiate battle brothers in power armour, and given an introduction to the chapter in a trial by fire. Out of the divergent chapters, the Black Templars are the only one that Games Workshop has really redone in style since the whole Primaris thing happened. They've got a small but very nicely executed range, I think. Unique Crusader squads, as we've just seen. These are the Primaris Sword Brethren they have. And they've got quite a nice upgrade sprue on the right compared with a few of the other Space Marines, including things like a few of their notable relics from the lore. They've also got quite a nice cast of characters as well. We've got High Marshal Helbrex, the Chapter Master on the left, the Feared Emperor's Champion wielding the Black Sword centrally here, and they've got a couple of generic HQs as well, such as the Castellan, who's basically their captain here on the right. For playstyle, the Black Templars tend to prefer things up close and personal, generally tending to be fairly melee heavy, and at the moment in game, most of their unique units are really quite cheap and effective indeed. The Primaris Crusader squad is nice. Most of their characters are really strong, 
and they get some unique tank variants with very cheaply costed multi-melters bolted to the top, and they're often just flatly better than some of the other things that other Space Marine chapters can field. They also get access to the Righteous Crusaders detachment, which is their chapter locked one that other chapters can't take. That allows them to swear various vows before the battle, to say uphold the honour of the Emperor, and that allows them to be a bit tougher in game, or suffer not the unclean to live, and that gives them extra damage in combat. Their melee stratagems and enhancements and things are quite nice for supporting them as they charge into the fray. They've got a nasty stratagem that allows them to keep an enemy unit locked in melee with them, which is usually not where you want to be. All of this comes together to be pretty good news for the Black Templars right now. They currently are really quite strong, winning a whole load of tournament games, and both the unique detachment and their unique unit options are rather nice. If you want to collect an entire army of black clad power armoured crusaders, then maybe the Black Templars are the right choice for you. Moving on, we've got the Sons of Sanguinius, the Blood Angels, basically angelic, tragic, fallen heroes of Warhammer 40k, striving to do the best despite their flaws, the red thirst that can lead them to descend into fits of rage, becoming murderous shock assault troopers at the time, and visions of their martyred Primarch Sanguinius, driving them steadily towards madness, the black rage, and having to seek an honourable death via the Death Company where the fallen marine takes the black and pledges themselves to die in combat against the enemy's foes before the madness overtakes them utterly. They're one of the more respected chapters in the Imperium, achieving great deeds despite insurmountable odds, and have a great preference for melee combat, usually soaring into battle on pinions of fire propelled by jump packs towards the enemy. Like the rest of these more divergent chapters, the Blood Angels have a fairly extensive range of their own. They've not seen that many releases in recent years from Games Workshop, here are the two most recently updated characters, Mephiston the Lord of Death, who has conquered the Black Rage once and for all, and the ancient but nonetheless mighty Chapter Master Dante, Lord Commander of the Imperium Nihilus. Otherwise, their more unique units are the Death Company, utterly savage combatants who have fallen to that Black Rage, the Sanguinary Guard, Golden Guardians of the Chapter Master himself, and they do have some unique War Machine patterns, the Bar Predator with its Flamestorm Cannon, and the Furioso Dreadnought and the Librarian pattern. In game, the Blood Angels unsurprisingly favour melee combat, usually making war with a heavy focus on their Death Company and Sanguinary Guard as their shock troops, the Bile Predators interesting enough in Ninth Edition with the big Flamestorm Overwatch, and the Librarian Dreadnought can teleport units around the board with its Wings of Sanguinius power, which is kind of cool as well. Their unique detachment is the Sons of Sanguinius one, which gives them a plus one attack and plus one strength on the charge, making them into excellent shock troops there. Though in general it's often not seen as quite as strong as one of the core Space Marine Gladius detachments, the advantage that that gives you with getting your units to melee being quite a big one. Currently the Blood Angels are struggling a little bit in game, neither their unique detachment nor their unique units seem to do quite enough for them to make them consistently win tournaments and things. There might be a chapter that Games Workshop decides to reward with some points or rules updates in the future. In any case though, they're a fun and dynamic army to collect, and if you want to put a force of red armoured jump pack space rings on the board hurtling towards the enemy, then maybe the Blood Angels are the ones for you. Moving on, we've got the black clad Xenos Hunters of the Space Marines, which are the Death Watch. These guys aren't really a chapter or such, but kind of space rings on loan to the Ordo Xenos of the Inquisition, the department that specialises on hunting down and exterminating the gravest alien threats. The forces of the Death Watch draw Space Marines from many chapters, each of which fighting with their own chapter's heraldry on the one shoulder pad and the silver of the Litany Xena Mortis on their left. In battle, they get access to the very best equipment that the Imperium has to offer, and typically tend to make war in small specialised strike teams where every member has their own specialist role, employing interesting equipment like Infernus Heavy Bolters, Frag Cannons or Heavy Thunder Hammers, plus combi bolters loaded with special issue ammunition that's all the better for destroying Xenos foes of one sort or another. Out of the Space Marine unique ranges, the Death Watch is perhaps the smallest one. It's mainly built around just a few kits. They're commanded by their Watchmasters and Captains, and they have a couple of kill team options, a more flexible multi-part one, and then the fairly core cool miniatures of kill team Cassius here, fielded as one set squad in-game. They also have their unique flyer in the Corvus Blackstar, a fairly heavily armed rapid insertion craft to get the kill teams where they need to be to take down their foes. In game they most typically tend to specialise in close range warfare, 
teleporting into position and then striking the foe down with frag cannon fire and special issue ammunition stratagems. Perhaps at the moment the Proteus kill team and their standard death wash veteran squads are some of the most interesting units just due to the sheer amount of core gear that they can bring and the flexibility at which they can deploy it. They're allowed to mix interesting unit types all up in one squad, so they have a squad of power armoured space marines plus some terminators and bikers, which is kind of abnormal. They also get access to their own unique detachment, the Black Spear Strike Force, and this basically allows you to cycle through different flavours of damage boost each turn, depending on what you need the most. Plus this is the way that you can access things like special issue ammunition, teleport tactics, and a few cool relics like the Term of Ectoclades for damage dealing, or the Beacon Angelus to teleport a squad about. Currently at time of recording, I'd rank them as perhaps sort of medium to strong for Space Marines. Bringing excess damage is definitely a nice thing to add to the party with their Black Spear stuff, plus their unique units are kind of interesting. Though I feel like losing the old style Oath moment with the wound rerolls was kind of nasty for them, as they quite like their devastating wounds weapons. Overall though, if you want to collect Space Marines of a very different flavour, a highly equipped Xenos hunting Spec Ops force, then the Death Watch might be for you. The Space Wolves of Fenris are the more Nordic and Viking themed warriors, making war in their classic blue-grey armour, and their allegiance where the Canis Helix on their gene seeds can lead them to degenerate over time, becoming Savage Wolfen if left unchecked, half Space Wolf, half Werewolf, and a whole load of rage. The more tempered effects of this make them very mighty close quarters combatants, generally preferring to lay the enemy low with frost weapons and hammers in combat, and they have long been under the command of Logan Grimnar, who has led them against many confrontations with their historic rivals the Thousand Sons over the chapter's long and sagaed history. The Space Wars really do have quite a big range of unique miniatures, including an awful lot of characters, though I would say that quite a lot of it's kind of old at the moment. Things like their Grey Hunters and Blood Claws are fairly old even for firstborn Space Marine kits, and they've only had a few slightly more recent updates, like Ragnar Blackmane being remade down on the bottom in the centre here. At some stage I'm sure Games Workshop will get around to redoing their range in full Black Templar style. Otherwise on the top left here we have the Devolved Savage Wolfen, and Logan Grimnar riding his Storm Rider chariot, pulled by a couple of Thunder Wolves, is definitely not a Santa sleigh. Otherwise, the Space Wolves definitely have a wolf fixation, they even have Thunder Wolf cavalry, and typically a lot of their miniatures are draped in furs, like the Wolf Guard Terminators here. Quite a fun and flavourful kit. At the moment, Thunder Wolves tend to be the order of the day for Space Wolves in game, they are really quite strong and fairly cheap to field. Lots of violent Viking clad warriors riding wolves into battle is really quite fun. Plus they've got some interesting options like their unique Dreadnoughts as well, beyond the Fell Handed and the Savage Murder Fan, plus maybe a few packs of Wild Fenrisian Wolves for support. The Champions of Rus is their own unique chapter lock detachment, and this one gives you some interesting mechanics for the characters doing great deeds and sagas. If they can achieve these objectives, then they unlock an army-wide boost for the rest of the army, either improving their melee damage, durability, or making them faster though those sagas are all kind of unreliable to do, and a bit dependent on your opponent allowing you to do them. Otherwise, they get plenty of melee support stratagems, but do tend to be a fairly close quarters focused army. Overall, for the Space Marines, I'd rate the Space Wolves as kind of middling in power right now. Their unique units are really quite good, and they do seem to have some good success in that new Stormlance formation from the Codex, the one that the White Scars are famed for. Though the Champions of Rust seems to be a little bit weaker than the standard Gladius formation, not really being quite as good as getting advance and charge, and being able to propel those Thunderwolves into combat at double speed. They can definitely hold their own overall though. If you want to collect an army of slightly wolf-obsessed Space Vikings, achieving great deeds for glory, then the Space Wolves might well be for you. Finally, amongst the many ranks of Space Marines, we have the Grey Knights. These guys operate in the most differently to any of their peers, as they function as the Demon Hunters of Titan based off a secret installation of Jupiter's moon and being dispatched in small brotherhoods to predict the arrival of demonic incursions and then fighting to seal these breaches in real space, both with some of the best technology that the Imperium has and also with their psychic mites and warp rituals, as every single one of these Grey Knight Space Marines is also a psyker, making them an unnaturally powerful resource to the Imperium. Unlike the rest of the chapters that we've talked about, the Grey Knights don't gain access to the vast majority of the Space Marine armoury, just a few crossover kits and common supporting vehicles such as Land Raiders, Rhinos and a few of the Flyers, but beyond that they have a small range of other unique units plus some characters. Most of the Grey Knights army is centred around just three plastic kits, the Grey Knights Terminator box set that you can see here wielding their Force Halberds and Demon Hammers, 
The Dreadnought Walker that carries a Terminator into battle, this one's designed to be able to take down greater demons, though is often affectionately referred to as the Baby Carrier by collectors. Otherwise they've got the Power Armoured Kit of Grey Knights that builds four different squad variants, these guys are the Teleporting Interceptor Squad, performing teleport shunts throughout the warp and then emerging when the enemy is least prepared. They do have a few unique characters as well, such as Castell and Crow here, He's the latest miniature that they've received at time of recording. I think he's got a pretty awesome miniature. And carries a cursed blade into battle that only he is pure enough to be able to hold without corruption. As armies go at the moment, the Grey Knights again are perhaps one of the very cheapest, perhaps even more so than standard Space Marines. They tend to be even more elites than their regular Marine Battle Brothers, so you need less of them. And the kits being at least kind of old and venerable within the range does mean that they're not charged at quite as much of a premium as some of the more recent releases are. They do have quite a nice combat patrol box that you can see here as well, Games Workshop's discount options for 40k. The Grey Knights one maybe doesn't have the biggest on paper discount, but it is pretty unique in that it contains pretty much the entire faction's range here. If you wanted to start a collection with a big bang, you could easily purchase multiple copies of this without much redundancy. In game, their rules are found in the digital download for Index Grey Knights. And interestingly enough, in 10th edition, their core rules are very focused on their teleport type tactics, kind of blinking around the board, sort of like Imperial Demons pretty much. At the end of the opponent's turn, multiple units go back into reserve and will teleport back down into yours, meaning that you can always get positioning advantages and make sure that you're constantly pressing the fight to the enemy. With their limited miniature range though, there perhaps isn't the biggest flexibility in different ways that you can fill the army. In general, it tends to be fairly focused on elite infantry, generally quite predisposed to fighting in melee a bit more so than fighting in range with those powerful force weapons that they have. Though they can muster a bit of close range shooting as well with psi cannons or maybe librarians hurtling out the vortex of doom. Currently in 40k, despite their teleport tricks, they are a bit on the weaker side right now. Games Workshop just didn't really give them all that many good ways of dealing with enemy monsters and vehicles on the table, which means that even if you can get some fairly godly positioning advantages, they're still a little bit limited, perhaps just a slightly harder to play faction than some of the others out there right now. Still though, they're a very cool army. If you want to play an army of silver-clad demon hunters that teleport all over the board and purge the chaos with cleansing flames, then maybe the Grey Knights are for you. Next up we have the worshippers of the machine god Omnisire in the form of the Adeptus Mechanicus, often shortened to Admech. These guys represent the creepy mechanically augmented legions that guard the Imperium's forge worlds, the great manufactorums that produce all the Imperium's arsenal of war that they need to continue the fight against the many enemies raised against them. Making up the core of their forces are legions of Skitari, Previously human soldiers that have been ravaged by bionicle mechanics, so are more akin to semi-living robots right now, and they often deploy all sorts of exotic technology in support of them, much devastating and arcane weaponry is found amongst their ranks. With some of their more exotic creations, they do have a bit of a steampunk vibe, I think. Miniatures-wise, their range is now a fairly medium-sized one, a relatively recent army in Warhammer 40k that have been around for less than a decade. Mechanical soldiers and war machines bedecked in the holy colour of red, a throwback to their homeworld of Mars. The range is somewhat divided into the Skitari troops plus the more weird and wonderful Cult Mechanicus creations. These are some standard Skitari rangers, pretty much the battle line of the army fighting with their galvanic rifles. On the Cult Mechanicus side, these are some Castellan robots, a date smith programming these guys with the floppy disks in the front of them, bearing heavy firepower with some phosphor blasters. And there's certainly an army that deploys some kind of surprising technology from the grim darkness of the far future. This Scorpius Dune Rider is basically a Normandy landing style hovercraft type thing, delivering Skitari forces down the drop ramp and into battle. Price wise, unfortunately, the Adeptus Mechanicus are pretty much one of the single most expensive armies in Warhammer 40k. Almost all of their units are really quite costly for the amount of points that you get on the board, meaning that an army that's collected to any given point scale in Warhammer 40k is likely to cost you more than their peers. This one's the upcoming combat patrol box set of the Adeptus Mechanicus with the Cerberus Riders and the Batwinged Taraxi. That should be dropping alongside their codex, and maybe just feels a little bit on the stingy side for models included, even if the miniatures in there are quite cool I think. At time of recording, their current rules are found in Index Adeptus Mechanicus, which can be downloaded from Warhammer Community, but Admech are going to be getting a codex release in the not too distant future, billed for winter 2023, so not long to wait there. It shall give them a few more different formations that they can fight with, 
Currently, they're mainly using their Rad Bombardment, which is maybe a bit of a weak mechanic that just throws a few mortal wounds about in the enemy deployment zone. Plus their Doctrina Imperatives that gives them benefits to their shooting in one way or another, either making them faster while they shoot or making them more accurate if they're stationary. It does only affect a subset of the army though. Playstyle wise, I'd certainly say that Admech are more focused on ranged warfare compared with close combat, though they do have a few melee specialists. Things like the Sindonian Dragoons with their Taser Lances, or the creepy Ross Stalkers with their augmented arms and legs. They'll be led into battle by some tech priest chanting hymns to the Omnisire and making their armies more powerful in one way or another. Have access to really quite a lot of small skirmisher type units, things like those Taraxi and the Cerberus Cavalry that range ahead of their forces. Currently in game I'd say that they're on the weaker end of Warhammer 40k right now for most standard lists. Their strongest armies at the moment tend to revolve very heavily around Catafron gun servitors, doing quite a lot of the heavy lifting and dealing with hard targets. Still though, that's probably going to change with an upcoming codex on the way. Overall, if you want to collect a mechanically augmented machine force of the Omnisire and destroy the enemy with crackling heavy weapons, then the Adeptus Mechanicus might be for you. Next up, we've got the normal humans in Warhammer 40k, the Emperor's Astra Militarum, aka the Glorious Imperial Guard. Where the Space Marines fight with genetic engineering and the finest weapons that the Imperium has, the Astra Militarum represents by far the majority of fighters in the galaxy. Normal humans equipped with basic flak armour, mass-produced laser-firing las guns, and backed up by some fairly fearsome tanks and artillery, again usually sent into the conflict in great quantities. The Imperial Guard have a famously diverse array of fighting styles across the galaxy as well, from the highly drilled exemplars of the Cadian shock troops, to the brutal strength of the muscled Kastachan jungle fighters, to the dour and useful Death Corps of Krieg. Besides more standard regiments as well, there's also the parallel force of the Militarum Tempestus Scions, stormtroopers with more advanced arms, armour and training, but are typically rewarded for this by grass shooting into the most dire areas of conflict imaginable. Miniatures wise, the Astra Militarum have been one of the most long-standing and biggest developed range of Warhammer 40k, Definitely quite a lot of their kits are at least fairly old, though they did get a recent range update within the last year or so, plenty of the oldest stuff getting updated and replaced. There are still some seriously old miniatures in their ranks though, things like the Rattling Snipers or the Cast Cham miniatures, and it would be quite nice if Games Workshop got around to updating all the regiments that they had in metal that gradually went out of production over the years. For a few examples of their range though, they generally tend to exemplify human fighting forces throughout history, perhaps the standard Cadians, Kastachans and Death Corps, mostly being somewhat reminiscent of 20th century infantry and tanks. Here we've got a Cadian command squad flying the regimental colours, and with a Vox operator to broadcast orders to the squads nearby. One of their most recent miniatures was the mighty Rogal Dawn battle tank, Really quite an enormous vehicle this one, and the bigger brother of the more standard and iconic Lehman Ross battle tank. The Guard are also known for their indirect fire support. The self-propelled artillery of the Basilisk will be able to hit units that they can't even see, and are currently able to slow down enemy infantry units that they target in-game. Finally, for example, the Militarum Tempestus Scions are sort of clad in their own Baroque-style armour, and their hotshot LAS weapons are connected to power packs on their back, which give them a little bit more stopping power and more ability to penetrate enemy armour. Unfortunately, like the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Astra Militarum are well known to be one of the most expensive armies that you can collect in Warhammer 40k. Due to their luckless nature of being standard humans trying to fight against a galaxy of horrors, their usual forces aren't particularly elite, so you need quite a lot of them. Besides their tanks and armour, most of their squads and things don't really cost all that many points in-game. Second-hand miniatures could be handy for building up a collection, plus third-party manufacturers or 3D printed bits. Due to their variety, you can basically have quite a lot of just generic sci-fi dudes in space holding energy weapons of one sort or another, and they can fill in for your rank and file. Their combat patrol box set here I think isn't the worst entry to the faction. It gets you a core of infantry with a command squad, plus some heavy weapons and a scouting sentinel. In game, the guard are currently represented by their index download from the Warhammer community page. There's no codex announced for them yet. Their core rules are heavily focused around their system of orders. Their commanders can order squads to move, move, move or take aim, making them a little bit faster or a little bit more accurate as needed. And I think it's quite evocative to have an old school command style structure in place. In battle, they tend to have heavy firepower backed up by attrition warfare with lots of bodies on the ground. Typically, tanks and artillery tend to be some of the main damage dealers of the army, 
with waves of infantry being sent forward to take objectives and grimly hold the line against the horrors that are coming towards them. Their combined regiment means that you can get reinforcements of units that you're losing game, and they do have plenty of other interesting auxilia and options that they can ally in, things like the abhuman ogren and Borgrins, who can handle themselves in close combat a bit better than the regular humans. Overall, currently in Warhammer 40k, they probably are still a little bit weaker than most, Quite a lot of their index is pretty viable in-game, but maybe just lack a little bit of raw power that some of the other factions have, and are maybe a bit harder to win tournament games as a result, though people do have their success with them. Overall, collecting a guard army can be a bit of an undertaking, with lots of models and a bit of a long project over time, but perhaps tend to be an army that's really quite long-standing and loved. And if you want to command the bulk of humanity, holding the line with little more than a bayonet and a las rifle, then the Astra Militarum might be for you. Moving on, we've got the Golden Armoured Super Soldiers of the Adeptus Custodes. These guys are essentially the Emperor's own Space Marine Legion, but their arcane genetic alchemy and the Emperor's own Gene Seed put them as far above a regular Space Marine as a regular Space Marine is above a standard human. The Custodes are the most elite fighting force in the Imperium, and the 10,000 stand strong against any enemy threats that might threaten the throne world of terror itself and seek to behead the Imperium and kill the Emperor. They tend to fight in a golden shield battle line, equipped with powerful power weapons and great dreadnoughts, and every warrior in their ranks is basically a hero in his own right, pretty much the equivalent of a character or leader of other factions. In recent years, Rebute Gilliman has mobilised them to be a bit more of an aggressive fighting force. Strike forces dispatched to end threats that threaten the entire Imperium before they even have the chance to reach terror, bringing the Emperor's judgement to worlds far afield. Miniatures wise, the Adeptus Custodes have a small plastic range, quite a recent one that didn't come out all that long ago and quite nice detailed sculpts, but in general their army tends to focus around about 5 main plastic kits, 3 flavours of elite infantry, some bikes and the Sisters of Silence. Perhaps uniquely out of any of 40k's current armies, they also are kind of heavily reliant on Forge World resin miniatures to really make them feel like a well-rounded force. They have a lot of other variants of infantry, and some interesting Dreadnought variants, and some tanks like the Caladius tank. These guys here are basically the standard Custodians, the Custodian Guard, they fight with powerful Guardian Spears, or Presidium Shields, and Sentinel Blades, and they'll often make up the battle line of an army. The Anti-Psychic Sisters of Silence fight alongside them, these are the Prosecutors equipped with bolt guns, they typically tend to come with rules that favour them hunting psychers and witches. Captain General Trajan Valoris is a High Lord of Terror and leader of the Custodes in Warhammer 40k. In game, he's equipped with the Watcher's Axe and has a moment shackle that allows him to fight first or get a whole load of extra attacks in combat. Finally, for one example of their Forge World range, here's the Telemorn Heavy Dreadnought, a big and chunky resin miniature from Forge World that's always famed for its defensive stats. This one striding forward, equipped with a Telemorn Cestus, will be able to laugh off the vast majority of enemy firepower. Price-wise, the Adeptus Custodes are perhaps famed to be one of the cheapest armies to collect in Warhammer 40k, though that's only really true if you stick to the plastic range of the army, where the chunky elite custodian guard generally costs loads of points in-game, so you can get up to a 2,000 point force really quite easily. The Combat Patrol box is this one that you can see here, and is famously one of the better ones. You get some of the jet bikes, the standard custodian guard, and two units of Sisters of Silence, and it's one of the best ones for points cost in the box. If you do dip into the Forge World models too heavily though, then that can be a lot more expensive. I've seen at least a fair few people 3D printing near proxies for that part of the army. In game, they're represented by their index currently. Their codex will be coming out in spring 2024. In general, they tend to operate as an elite infantry battle line, striding up towards the foe, and typically preferring melee damage over range, putting the smack down with their guardian spears, and boosted by their martial katar rule that allows them to adopt different fighting stances in combat. In general, they tend to be one of the easier armies to play in Warhammer 40k, at least gameplay-wise, usually just march up to the objectives and put the smack down on the enemy. Hard to go too far wrong with. Though currently following some nerfs to the rules and points of the faction, that they are maybe a little bit weaker than most in the game. There's just a lot more armies that can pass the stat check that is their mighty toughness values and 2 plus armor saves, and be able to deal enough damage to break their battle line. Still though, might mean that they get some balance updates for the positive in the future. In any case, if you want to collect an army of super elite golden guardians of terror, then the Adeptus Custodes might well be for you. Moving on, we have the Adeptus Auroritus, the Imperium's faithful nuns with guns, and known to many as the Sisters of Battle. These girls are an all-female order of warrior nuns dedicated to protecting the Imperial faith. 
brought about by some arcane rules that said the ecclesiarchy was not allowed to have any men under arms, so they turned to women. In the present day, they ensure that the Imperium at large doesn't turn their back on the Emperor's light, and they're generally tending to be quite well equipped. Power armour and bolters are the standard weapons, kind of similar to the Space Marines, though they do have a particular fondness for Melter and Flamer weapons, purging the foes and burning the heretics at glorious close range. Their faith certainly doesn't go unrewarded, though. Often in battle, certain seemingly miraculous actions might happen, and they attribute this to the will of the Emperor intervening directly in their conflicts. Miniatures-wise, the Adeptus Auroritas have a fairly solid model range. They had quite a recent and extensive range refresh around about five years ago now. And for the most part, their new updated sculpts got a lot of love. They had been languishing as a somewhat mothballed army with a bunch of metal miniatures for really quite a long time before that. In general, their sculpts tend to be quite popular though, and the range is somewhat divided between a core of more standard sisters units, plus the forces of the Ecclesiarchy, with some frothing zealots hurling themselves into battle. The main focus of their range generally seems to be on the elite infantry. First up, here's their standard battle sister squad, supported by a couple of sinister cherubs bearing sensors. Here's the fancy rolling reliquary that is the Immolator, a bit of a mad tank with some enormous heavy flamethrowers to purge the Emperor's foes, while also being a little rolling shrine with a bunch of stained glass on there. For some elites of the sisters, here are the Seraphim, descending from the skies like angels of death and fighting with dual bolt pistols or hand flamers. And here's one of the mad miniatures of the Ecclesiarchy, the rampaging torture device that's known as the Penitent Engine, a grave convicted sinner of the Imperium strapped to it to feed the machine, which hurls itself into battle to get itself destroyed and take down a lot of the enemies with it. Price-wise, to collect the Sisters of Battle with quite a lot of new kits and tending to be somewhat elite but maybe not to the extent of Space Marines, it is quite an expensive affair. Particularly a fair few of their elite infantry just don't really get you many points on the board for how much they cost. I would say that their combat patrol is a fairly good one though. It does have the disadvantage of being monopost models and maybe some slightly small weird unit sizes here. But you do get quite a lot of miniatures on the board with it. If I was starting Sister of Battle I'd likely pick up a couple of copies of this. Rules wise their army is found in Index Adeptus Auroritus at the moment. At time of recording their next codex hasn't been announced and their core rules involve generating miracle dice from the enemy destroying your units or certain other actions and then you roll that dice and you keep the result and you can substitute that result into later dice rolls so ideally you want lots of sixes. Can be a really big deal if you hit an enemy with a big multi-melter shot and it goes through their armour. Then you can just automatically plug in a 6 damage result to capitalise on extra power when you need it the most. Their squads also get a bit stronger as their members are martyred, but that does kind of depend on the units being injured but not killed, and maybe doesn't have as much impact in-game. Traditionally, the sisters have generally been an army of heavy-hitting damage dealers on kind of fragile elite infantry, things like Retributors or Repenture that have loads of damage but aren't too hard to take down. They do have quite a lot of melee units and a big emphasis on close-range shooting, things like Melter Guns and Flamers. Currently, weirdly enough, Games Workshop's got the balance of the index a little bit strange. Often lists tend to go really quite heavy on their armour, like Exorcists or Castigator battle tanks. Though quite a lot of heroes and their unique leader units do tend to be quite powerful, such as Saint Celestine here. Currently, for strength in Warhammer 40k and tournament performance, they seem to be around about mid-strength, really. I feel like GW could probably do things to improve the internal balance of their codex, though, and make a few more choices a bit more tempting. In any case, if you want to collect an entire army of power-armoured warrior nuns, then maybe the Sisters of Battle might be for you. Moving on, next up we have the Imperial Knights. Basically an entire army of vehicles and super heavy walkers piloted by nobles going to war in the colours of their household and achieving mighty victories for the Imperium. The Imperial Knights often tend to fight as a force of knights and squires, nobles and the super heavy walkers backed up by their armager bondsmen, and fighting great noble households that are either allied to the Imperium itself or the Adeptus Mechanicus, perhaps not too surprising given the needs to manufacture and produce and maintain these mighty war suits. Miniatures wise, knight armies tend to look quite striking on the table. Again, all the miniatures are relatively recent ones as far as Games Workshop goes, built around three main plastic kits that build multiple variants of knight class walker. And then there are a few that seem to be packaged and more aimed at the Horus Heresy, some plastic Serastus knights, and a couple of somewhat expensive Forge World Resin ones. On the right here, we have the Armager Warglaives often functioning as basically the battle line and basic troops of the army, given that these are the smaller squires in the army pretty much. They fight with some powerful anti-tank weapons with the Thermal Spear and the Reaper Chain Cleaver. 
The most standard class of Imperial Knight is the Questorus class, and this one is a Warden in that class. Wardens fight with the Avenger Gatling Cannon, an enormous weapon that can pulverise enemy infantry formations and is particularly good at slaying Space Marines. In game currently, they're rather resolute and have extra defensive rules, making their armagers harder to kill. The Dominus class knight packs the most firepower out of any of the plastic model classes. This one is the Knight Castellan and has a massive volcano lance plus an enormous plasma weapon and is covered with other guns like twin melter guns, siege breaker cannons and shield breaker missiles. Castellans tend to be the choice if you just absolutely want to lay waste to enemy armour with that volcano lance. Then the ones that are more aimed at heresy, this one is the Plastic Knight Lancer. It does have rules for Warhammer 40k though. These ones are utterly brutal, charging into melee with their shock lances. And finally here we have an example of the Resin Knight Porphyrion. This one's one of the expensive ones from Forge World and is the single biggest knight class. The Porphyrion's armed with some enormous Magna Las cannons that utterly lay waste to enemy armour. In general I'd argue that the Imperial Knights tend to be one of the cheaper armies to collect in Warhammer 40k. Unfortunately they don't tend to have any discount deals but you don't really need that many models to create a completed army. An army of Imperial Knights could just literally be four big models, kind of expensive but maybe not so compared with the amount of kits that you need to get to any given points level of other factions. And the armages I think tend to be a bit better than normal for most 40k vehicles. I'd certainly recommend using some magnets for the big knights. It can be really quite nice to swap out loadouts between games. And it means that you can really quite easily have just about all the options available to the faction just by swapping out arm loadouts. In game their rules are found in Index Imperial Knights. The core rules for the faction are the Code Chivalric Oaths that you can swear. You either get extra damage or extra mobility and you have to try and do a quest like destroy the enemy warlord. If you manage that then you earn some command points and you also get some further boosts. The core detachment rule for the faction gives you a feel no pain type save so a little bit more durable than you otherwise would be. In terms of playstyle the knights are a bit different of an experience compared with the majority of 40k armies out there. You are basically just playing an entire army worth of vehicles and lots of super heavy walkers so it does mean that just about every list that you make is kind of going to be a skew list and sometimes that can make them feel a bit weird when they're interacting with other enemy armies. Some enemy units are going to be kind of pointless, it might be a little bit of a stat check as to how much anti-tank they brought, maybe a little bit more problematic at a very casual level as opposed to a competitive one. Otherwise though they do tend to be a fairly easy to master playstyle, just literally a lot of heavy weapons and big chunky vehicles is hard to go too far wrong with when every model in your army is a scary damage dealer. Otherwise they have a mechanic for bondsman abilities between their armagers and Questorus knights where if you run them in pairs then you can get some benefits for your little guys. Overall again maybe kind of similar to the Adeptus Custodes, they were very strong at the start of 10th edition then got toned down in power really quite radically. They do tend to be an army that does a bit better at more casual levels compared with more competitive levels though. In any case, if you want to collect an army of chivalric super heavy war machines, then maybe the Imperial Knights are for you. Finally for the forces of the Imperium, we come to the Imperial Agents. The forces of mankind have many and diverse forces across the galaxy, a lot of which aren't really armies in their own right but might well show up on the battlefield for one reason or another, either to complete specific missions, command armies, or out of sheer desperation and necessity. There are the shadowy forces of the commanding inquisition with their unquestioned authority, imperial assassin sent to take down certain key targets, and rogue traders plying the void and fighting where their fortune takes them. Miniatures wise, quite a few of the squads of these have been released in kill team type boxes recently, such as the imperial navy breaches here. The assassins have also received at least somewhat recent miniatures, a few of the inquisitors are resin miniatures and kind of dated though. One of the classic inquisitors is Inquisitor Kotiaz, he's got a very imperial looking double headed cyber eagle there plus his nemesis demon hammer. And here's an Adeptus RBT's exaction squad, pretty much the imperial police or FBI, typically sent to apprehend and capture very high value targets such as rogue planetary governors or alpha level psychers going rogue. The rules for these guys operate somewhat differently to the rest of the Imperial forces. They come as a 40k index download, but don't actually have any core rules or stratagems or things like that. They've just got rules for allying to any Imperial force, where different points levels can take different amounts of them, usually different numbers of characters plus retinues. How they play really does depend on the unit or the character in question. The assassins generally operate as lone operatives, dispensing their own flavour of death while hopefully trying not to get killed. The Inquisitors can lead other Imperial units and these squads more function just as standard things on the battle line. 
I said most of these are in the region where they're just not really all that strong. Kind of interesting enough choices that could be the right one for your given playstyle or unit needs. Perhaps one of the most commonly played is the Calidus Assassin right now, which brings a lot of value to the table, jumping on and off the board doing secondary objectives, plus ruining enemy stratagems. Sometimes they can be kind of helpful just for very cheap infantry units as well to hold down objectives or just be expendable screens. Though quite a lot of Imperial factions do have units in the same sort of ballpark cost as them now, so maybe that's a little bit less of a role than it was. Can be handy enough for Imperial Knights though I suppose. In any case, if you want to add a little bit of Inquisitorial Authority or harness some powerful assassins allied to your forces, then you can put in some Imperial Agents in your army. Moving on to the Forces of Chaos next, and first up we have the Chaos Space Marines. They're pretty much the archetypical bad guys of the faction, mostly hailing from the traitor legions that betrayed the Emperor in the Horus Heresy, and were subsequently driven into the Eye of Terror to wait for millennia, before Abaddon the Despoiler shattered the Cadian Gate and unleashed chaos across much of the Imperium. In their long sequestration within the Eye of Terror, they've changed quite a lot since their Warhammer 30k versions, often sporting mutations or possessed by demons, and often fighting alongside demon engines that are looked over by their warpsmiths. Like the Loyalists, their legions are really quite distinct in character, having a lot of their own personality, whether it's the spooky scary night lords, or the profanely zealous preachings of the word bearers. Miniatures wise, Games Workshop has had quite a lot of releases for the Chaos Space Marines since 8th edition came out, gradually replacing much of the range. As a result, most of their core models are really quite nice ones now I think, though a few relics do persist, like Land Raiders, Defilers and the standard bikes. They generally tend to be quite busy models with a fair bit of trim going on. Can maybe take a little bit more effort than most to get on the table perhaps. One recent miniature release that they had were these Chosen, elite Chaos Space Marines fighting with some of the best war gear that their legion can muster. One example of one of their demon engines is the spider-like Venom Crawler, acting as a psychic siphon for twisted demonic energy and scuttling across the board to destroy enemy infantry with its tendrils and its cannons. Unlike the standard Space Marines, the heretics are often accompanied into battle by mortal followers, Cultists flock to worship their legion and are used as disposable line infantry. And for one example of a character model, the Master of Possession is really quite a fun one I think. He hovers aloft leading the possessed into battle and can try and possess enemy leaders in game. Price wise, as Warhammer 40k armies go, I'd argue that Chaos Space Marines are one of the slightly less pricey ones. They generally tend to be at least fairly elite, they do have access to a fair few less discount sets compared with the loyalists at least. I think the combat patrol box pictured here is okay, comes with a dreadnought, some basic line infantry and some havocs, all really quite nice miniatures though I must admit maybe not the strongest in game currently at time of recording. For gameplay the Chaos Space Marines use Index Chaos Space Marines which I think is pretty interesting and does have some nice flavourful rules in it, there's going to be a full codex coming for them in 2023. The Chaos Legions work slightly differently to the Loyalist ones, the Death Guard, Thousand Sons and World Eaters all have their own indexes with their own versions of certain data sheets within Codex Chaos Space Marines that don't get access to everything. On the tabletop, the core rules for the Chaos Space Marines are the Dark Packs. This allows you to risk some mortal wounds via a leadership check to get some powerful damage boosts. It's really quite a fun rule, I think, kind of evocative of the risk of Chaos and does give you some powerful damage boosts. And then you've got a system of marks for dedicating each of your units to different chaos gods in game. And the marks are kind of meaningful, giving you big damage boosts when you make those dark packs, or making certain stratagems a lot more powerful. In general, with those supporting rules, Chaos Space Marines generally tend to be an army of some pretty massive damage dealers. As a faction, they perhaps skew a little bit more towards melee than shooting for most of their miniatures, though they do have some very, very strong shooting options at the moment with things like Forge Fiends or Obliterators, utterly ruinous with the firepower that they can put out, and particularly in the Mark of Chaos Undivided. They've got a very powerful stratagem for Nurgle as well, allowing you to shield units from being shot reactively in the enemy turn, which is kind of enormous for messing with their shooting priority. Currently at time of recording, that has Chaos Space Marines as one of the very strongest armies in Warhammer 40k. They are winning a whole load of tournaments at the moment, and it will be interesting to see what sort of other playstyles their codex gets when it comes out. Finally, I thought that seeing as these sub-faction themes are just perhaps a bit more big for the Chaos Legions compared with certain other armies out there, it might be worth going through them individually. Currently, at time of recording, they don't really have any big in-game rules differences. You still use the same Chaos Codex and represent them via the miniatures that you pick, but they do have pretty strong theming and a lot of backstory behind them. 
Unfortunately, Games Workshop doesn't really provide as much support for the unique Chaos Legions compared with the Loyalist ones. Lots of Chaos Legions don't have their own unique special character or anything, though if you do dip into the Horus Heresy range a little bit, you can find some Forge World options that give you some really quite nice themed bits, which could be nice to mix in with some plastic kits in the army. Could be worth a look if you want to create something unique, and of course plenty of third party bits manufacturers make some pretty relevant stuff. Going through the legions, and first up we have the Black Legion. This is Horus's old legion that's now commanded by Abaddon the Despoiler, the architect of the Black Crusades and the guy who shattered the Cadian Gate. They tend to be a pragmatic, balanced and mighty force, often making good use of legionaries and terminators, and they have both Abaddon's core cool miniature here, plus Harkon World Claimer as their unique minis. The Emperor's Children are the legion that's dedicated to Slanesh, kind of waiting on their own codex or index release at some stage at the moment. It seems very likely that at some point Games Workshop will give them a treatment similar to Death Guard Thousand Sons and World Eaters. For the meantime though, they're staying within Codex Chaos Space Marines. They've got Lucius the Eternal as a unique miniature, though at the moment it's only the Horus Heresy version of him that's on sale. And dedicated to their patron deity, they're utterly perfectionist and make war with sonic weapons and good use of combat drugs and field iconic noise marines within their ranks. Definitely a legion in need of a bit more love though, with some unique noise marine miniatures too. The Iron Warriors are the bitter siege experts with big firepower, they're massive rivals of the Imperial Fists, and have had several bloody conflicts with them over the course of the galactic history. Compared with the rest of the Chaos Space Marine legions, they tend to be more focused on range and heavy firepower, often having loads of obliterators and forge fiends within their ranks, and they feel like a force that Vashtor will get along well with. The crazed murderers of their night lords follow in the footsteps of Conrad Kurz, making war with shock tactics and terror troops, often striking from the shadows, jumping around with jump packs. Raptors and warp talons are pretty appropriate for fielding with them. Their armor crackles with lightning energy, and they're often famed for flaying their enemies. Really not a chaos legion that you want to get on the wrong side of, perhaps more so than most, weirdly. The sneaky and enigmatic alpha legion make war in their metallic teal armor. These guys basically feel like the special forces of chaos, always infiltrating, subverting, and having schemes within schemes. Wherever they go, ruin is sure to follow, with uprising, sabotage, and brutal ambushes and assassinations. You also get the benefit of each one of your leaders declaring themselves to be Alpharius before he is killed. You never know when the many heads of the Hydra will manifest themselves next. The word bearers are zealous evangelists of the Dark Gods, often covered in heretical texts on their flesh and on their armour and attempts to convert the masses against the Emperor's light, and to follow the worship of the true gods. In their ranks, they make great use of dark apostles, and tend to have lots of possessed and demon kin, willing to enter into dark packs from the other side more so than most. Accursed cultists and possessed are fairly quite nice choices in-game currently at the moment as well. There's plenty more than that for other theming for the Chaos Space Marines out there, loads of warbands out there. Perhaps for a couple of more notable ones with miniature support, there's Huron Blackheart of the Red Corsairs, the Tyrant of the Badab War, and has his backstory extensively fleshed out in the Imperial Armour books in days past. And Fabius Bile, the renegade ex-apothecary of the Emperor's Children, obsessively improving on the Space Marine design and creating great hulking monsters within his forces. His creations of Bile can be a powerful ally to various Chaos Warbands, but they'll generally come with their own agenda and a hefty price. There's loads more in the lore for other Chaos Warbands though, the Fallen of the Dark Angels, the Crimson Slaughter, and many more. Definitely a lot of scope for just making your own if you'd like to. In any case, if an army of power-armoured super soldiers dedicated to the cause of the Dark Gods and the downfall of the Imperium sounds right for you, then maybe you should think about collecting Chaos Space Marines. Next up, let's dive into the God March Legions, and first up we've got Blood for the Blood God with the World Eaters, Corn's very angry space marines, and some of the most excellent shock troopers in the entire galaxy. The Legion makes war with vast waves of corn berserkers, destroying the enemy ranks and being utterly unstoppable and ferocious in melee. A Legion driven mad by the cybernetic implants that are the butcher's nails, providing great strength and melee power at the small price of sending them somewhat insane with fits of rage. I feel like they were kind of easy pickings for corn. The World Eaters have only recently been an army in their own right, and as such they've got a very small range of miniatures, mainly just revolving around a few plastic kits, the Corn Berserkers, Jackals, Juggernaut Lords, Angron, Khan the Betrayer, and the Eight Bound. On top of that, they get access to a bunch of standard Chaos Space Marine kits, mainly the tanks and vehicles, but not so much the infantry units. 
and they seem like an army that's almost guaranteed to have a major release wave in 10th edition when their codex comes out. There's quite a lot of units that are specifically teased by Games Workshop that should make an appearance when their book comes out. Going through some of their models, here's an example of an 8-bound, a corn berserker that's been possessed with 8 blood letters of corn all in one frame, stronger, tougher and faster than regular corn berserkers as a result. The standard corn berserkers are nonetheless ferocious and are the shock troopers that make up the battle line, they're often fielded in rhinos, and have a fun special rule when they run closer to the enemy if the enemy suddenly shoots them. Here's the spectacular demon Primarch Angron, a great demon of rage fighting with his paired weapons Samniarius and Spine Grinder. When slain in game, he has a good chance to return to reality later on if your blessings of corn dice roll out a 666. Finally, here's Lord Invocatus, a juggernaut lord. He can allow the corn 8 units to scout into battle and move into the midfield before the game's even begun. That can be bad news for your opponent as it can set up some very easy first turn charges. Price-wise, the World Eaters are perhaps even more elite than most standard Chaos Space Marines, which generally tends to be good news for getting them on the board. Angron's quite a nice miniature and is really quite strong in game and takes up a lot of points. He's quite an easy way to get a good chunk of your army in one go. And I feel like compared with most, their Combat Patrol box set is quite a nice one. Two units of Corn Berserkers, one unit of Jackals and a Juggernaut Lord. That's three of their five main plastic kits all in one go there. And I feel like this is definitely one that I'd be tempted to get two of to get basically all the berserkers that you'd ever need, plus some supporting HQs and chaff troops. Their current rules are from the digital index download from Games Workshop. I'd guess they might be one of the releases slightly later on in the edition. And their core rules are the big blessings of corn roll, where you roll eight different dice and then get to choose some suitably violent buffs from a big table. Lots of direct increases in melee damage, but perhaps the best are the extra movement and advance and charge they can get. It means that you can have World Eaters hurtling into the enemy deployment zone right from turn 1. Playstyle-wise, they are pretty limited really. They're pure melee aggression and just violent combat with chain axes pretty much throughout the army. I guess the World Eaters probably wouldn't have it any other way though. Perhaps some of their biggest moves are throwing those 8 bounds and corn berserkers forward early in the game as mentioned, plus the enormous threats to resurrect Angron if he gets slain. If you get lucky, he can come back later on, and that's just monstrously powerful for such a big model. Overall, between all that, they seem to be doing pretty well overall, with a good win percentage at tournaments, and it seems to be a good time to be a chain axe wielding maniac of the Blood God. Overall, if you want a terrifying army of Shock Trooper Chaos Space Marines that just charge forward and hack things to bits, then the raw aggression of the World Eaters might be for you. From Corn to Nurgle next, and here we have the diseased legions of the Death Guard. Mortarian sons made a pact with Nurgle as warp plagues tore through their become ships in the warp, and now the entire legion is in a state of perhaps semi-undeath, bodies rotting and falling apart at the same time, but nonetheless perpetually living and marching ever onwards, making their plague marines spectacularly hard to kill with conventional weapons. As per their patron deity, they make war with chemical and disease warfare, often in a grim, gruelling war of attrition. Bloated demon engines and blight launchers spew forth all sorts of noxious chemicals, and they're often accompanied into war by shambling pox walker hordes, cultist followers reduced to mindless zombies of Nurgle. Miniatures-wise, compared with the Thousand Sons and World Eaters, they've got a far bigger range than those guys, given that they were the antagonist faction out of 8th edition, so basically most of their range is both quite recent and also quite nicely executed, I think. Their miniatures maybe are a little bit busy, and the disturbing plague aesthetic perhaps appeals to some people more than others, but they do have a whole load of character. Here are the basic battle line plague marines, equipped with all manner of heavy weapons and heavy plague weapons in combat. The box of them comes in Nurgle's iconic number of seven. For some elite to the Death Guard, there are the Death Shroud Terminators, fighting with their iconic scythes. A pretty brutal force in game, very slow and inexorable, but murderous in combat and very hard to kill. Primarch Mortarian himself is often found winging his way on the diseased wings above his ranks, bearing his great size silence and accompanied by numerous little demon attendants. And they do have several diseased bloated demon engines, such as the Plague Burst Crawler here, firing pestilent shells into the enemy, and these brutal artillery pieces seem to be near auto include in competitive lists right now. Both pretty tough, fairly dangerous with direct fire weapons, and the barrage fire that they bring is pretty terrifying. Price-wise, again, being a somewhat elite faction generally is good news for them not costing as much as some. 
though I sort of feel temporarily now Games Workshop has decreased the price on quite a lot of their units in game, they maybe do need a few more models than you would otherwise do, and that makes them a bit more expensive to collect as a result. They also have a combat patrol box that is generally considered to be one of the bad ones really. It's just perhaps a bit strange that it's so pox walker heavy, 7 played marines, typhus, a support character, then no less than 30 pox walker zombies, I still probably get one to flesh out a horde component of the army. But I feel like most people probably aren't collecting death guard for the pox walkers, it would have been nice to see some terminators or something in here. Currently their rules are still via digital index download, no announcement of the codex yet so far, and their core rule is kind of a fun nurgle one. Enemy units within contagion range of their forces get various debuffs, minus one toughness from the core rule, and then things like either minus one to hit, or your weapons being an extra AP more effective against them, perhaps being particularly punishing for enemy melee troops needing to get close, and suffering some big debuffs and being easy to kill when they are. Traditionally, Death Guard have generally tended to be an excessively durable anvil of a faction, typically dealing not that much damage, but being able to take a lot in return. Currently though I'd say that that's maybe not really the case as much at the moment, and they're perhaps a little bit more balanced overall, the Plague Marines are very dangerous with all their special weapons that they can bring, and things like the Death Shroud and the popular Plague Burst Crawlers are fairly balanced in damage and defence. Overall I feel like they're in a fairly good place currently, a few units that are maybe a little subpar, but generally most of their good stuff is usable, and they're ranking around about mid-tier in faction power levels in 40k currently. Overall, if you want to corrupt the galaxy for Nurgle and field great diseased waves of Plague Marines, then the Blighted Legion of the Death Guard might be for you. Moving on to Zinch next, and the magical forces of the Thousand Sons. These sorcerers of Zinch are the followers of Magnus, and in their legion's history, Zinch perhaps took a bit too much interest in their forces, bestowing them with numerous mutations to the point where much of their legion was breaking down, so Araman the Sorcerer wrought a great enchantment and reduced most of their legion to dusty clanking automata, most of their warriors now little more than shells of armour propelled by sorcerous means. Perhaps the only true Thousand Sons left are their cabals of sorcerers, which constantly scheme and feud against each other. Their great cults and magic are often seen menacing the Imperium, cooking up great rituals to unleash calamities on the rest of the galaxy and requiring great power and sacrifices to overcome. The historic rivals of the Space Wolves, who burned their homeworld of Prospero to the ground during the Horus Heresy, even though Magnus reportedly did nothing wrong. Miniatures wise, the Thousand Suns fill in a similar sort of place to the World Eaters perhaps, a small range of plastic kits including their Rubric Marines, their Scarab Occult Terminators, some Sorcerers and Magnus, and then backed up by a lot of standard Chaos Space Marines sort of choices like armour and demon engines and things, and then interestingly enough some Birdmen ported from Age of Sigma, Zangors are their mutated raised cultist variant, I feel like their Rubric Marines look rather striking when painted up, they've definitely got some cool Space Egyptian vibes going on much like the rest of the Legion, though again are an army that's kind of famously noted for the amount of trim that you might have to paint with them, a bit more complicated than most if you are looking to replicate the box art. Otherwise here's their winged Primarch Magnus the Red, an absolute terror in game at the moment with the amount of psychic might that he can throw out, and a big linchpin for the army. Otherwise the other main rubric battle line type unit are the Scarab Occult Terminators, Quite an interesting big synergy damage dealer type unit with their Prosperine Capeches and interesting Inferno Bolt combi weapons. And here are their cultist Zangors, some goat birdmen that can add a little bit of expendable chaff to an otherwise quite elite army. Similar to the Death Guard, the Thousand Sons maybe have a slightly unhelpful combat patrol I'd argue. Again weirdly focused on their cultists with two sets of Zangors in here, plus some Terminators and the Infernal Master. Again probably worth picking up one of them but otherwise you might just be going a little bit heavy on the Zangors, depending on whether or not you really want to have loads of those or not. I still say that they generally tend to be a cheaper army to collect though, despite that. The Rubik Marines and the Scarab Occult kits generally get you a fair amount of points on the board, and they do tend to make up quite a lot of the bulk of their forces in characters as well, which again tend to be kind of pricey points-wise. Their current rules I think are quite fun in 10th edition 40k, their main one is their Kabbalistic Rituals, which allows you to access one of a table of some very powerful effects in game virtually wherever you want on the board. Thousand Sons really feel like an army that has a massive amount of options available to them, with things like double moves, extra damage via Doom Bolt, or removing enemy saves able to pop up where they want. 
They're called hermetic amplifiers. Any psychic damage that the unit does, and with lots of sorcerers, that tends to be quite a bit. And in general, their main playstyle tends to be some pretty character-heavy elite infantry, lots of small squads of Rupert Marines, maybe some Scarab Occult Terminators, and lightly Magnus, with a great number of different kinds of sorcerer in their ranks, marching up to the objectives and holding them against the enemy. A fair few of their non-sorcerer things and Zangors are maybe a little bit underpowered at the moment, though. Overall, I feel like they're doing okay in game at the moment, despite some nerfs from early in 10th edition. They're definitely still taking down their fair share of tournaments, and I feel like they're in a fairly good spot on the tabletop now, with most of their most iconic stuff being pretty good in game. In any case, if you want an army of sinister dusty rubrique commanded by scheming sorcerers, then the Thousand Sons might be for you. Moving on from the followers of the Dark Gods to their physical manifestations themselves, the Chaos Demons are the howling horrors of the Warp and the Empyrean, constantly fighting against each other in the great game, and always seeking to break into real space, and turn the galaxy into little more than a playground for the thirsting Chaos Deities. Chaos Demons typically make war in great incursions into real space, often when the fabric of reality is torn asunder by a renegade Psyker. Other legions of one or more deity may walk forth into the material realm, destroying all before them. The demons are the embodiments of Kornslanesh, Nurgle, and Zinch, and have many powerful lesser entities within their ranks, both foot troops and enormous greater demons of terrifying threat. The Chaos Demons have a fairly big range in Warhammer 40k, perhaps surprisingly focused on character miniatures, which around about half the units in their index happen to be characters of one sort or another. The range is quite big when they're taken as one army, though they're kind of divided into four separate armies, one for each of the Chaos Deity, with their own look, fighting styles, and typically having things like their own chariots, foot troops, cavalry, and beasts. The Chaos Demons have generally had some fairly steady releases over the last decade or so, and now most of the range is at least in fairly good shape. There are a few older relics amongst the ranks, though some of the lesser demons are a little bit showing their age, really. And there are still a few resin fine cast miniatures about, for a few examples of the horrors of the warp spawn, here's a change caster of Zinch, a sorcerer horror commanding some mighty magics. Here's a blood crusher of corn, a blood letter riding a fearsome juggernaut into battle, and cornate cavalry to trample the foe beneath its brass hooves. Here are some fiends of Slanesh, twisted beasts of excess, fighting with whip tails and powerful crab claws, very swift and deadly. And here's a great unclean one of Nurgle. One of the four greater demons, great unclean ones are notoriously hard to kill, a diseased rotting bag of flesh and pestilence, walking across the board and crushing enemies beneath its bulk. Price-wise, I'd rate the Chaos Demons as somewhat middling for Warhammer 40k. Previously it might have been a bit higher than this, given that they tended to run fairly hoardy in ages past, but now things like even the lesser demons generally tend to be at least fairly powerful troopers in their own right, and you don't tend to need quite as many of them. Combat patrol discounts are kind of limited though, it's only really useful if you're collecting corn demons and want them as a major feature of your army. Though I feel like as it goes this one's really quite a good one for getting a cornate army on the go, 3 blood crushers, a bunch of flesh hounds, 20 blood letters and a herald. Kind of a shame that they did away with the start collecting boxes for the other chaos deities though. While we're on value of the army as well, it's probably worth noting that you can field a bunch of the miniatures in Age of Sigmar as well if you want to play that game system can be interesting if you want an army that can hop between two different game systems and potentially see play on fantasy battlefields as well as grim dark ones. The rules for the Chaos Demons are always a bit different to most other armies in Warhammer 40k. Generally they're entities that manifest themselves out of the warp so you can have demons popping up all over the board via the deep strike mechanic and due to their otherworldly nature they don't have standard armor saves as such, the vast majority instead relying on demonic invulnerable saves that mean that enemy volume fires are a bit more useful and high AP weapons less so. Their core rules for the faction on top of that are Shadow of the Warp and Warp Rifts, the idea being two corrupt areas of the board which means that Battleshock is more dangerous to your units and restores yours if you pass tests, and Warp Rifts means that you can have demons coming up worryingly close to the enemy army if they happen to be in an area of your influence of the board. Otherwise, beyond that, each patron deity has its own miniature flair. Nurgle's very durable, Slanesh is swift and melee focused, Zinch tends to be more range focused and gets high and vulnerable saves, and Korn is just generally mighty with some big melee smackdown. The great undivided demon prince Belakor is also a pretty strong linchpin of the army as well, carrying around his own shadow of chaos and preventing your armies from getting shot at range. 
currently power-wise, I'd rank the Chaos Demons as medium within Warhammer 40k. They definitely have some interesting tricks, and their builds are a bit more varied than they used to be after the big points adjustments Games Workshop made. This often do still tend to revolve fairly heavily around the Greater Demons, though. In any case, if you want an army of warp spawn clawing their way into reality, then maybe the Chaos Demons could be the army for you. Finally for Chaos, we have the Dark Mirror of the Imperial Knights. The Chaos Knights are fallen nobles and renegades, turned from chivalry to be raw engines of destruction in service of the ruinous powers, ranging from anything to servants of the Dark Mechanicum. Corrupted nobles going on black quests to enact their vengeance against the Imperium for perceived slights, or demonic knights with possessed pilots, spreading the glory of their patron god far and wide. The horse tend to be twisted, warped and mutated, and bear the sigils of chaos rather than the Imperium, and in battle they have unnatural abilities, perhaps particularly noted for their unholy aura of dread and terror, the knights bringing some demonic despair to their foes. Miniatures-wise, the Chaos Knight's force is pretty much the dark mirror of the Imperial Knight's range, they only really have two major kits that are actually dedicated Chaos Knight kits, the War Dogs and their Abhorrent Class kits that builds the Abominant and a few others. But both of those are really quite nicely done, I think, do quite well to represent Spiky Knights in-game, and have a fair few fun customizable options. On top of that, they can basically use just about every one of the Loyalist kits and the Heresy Era pattern ones from Forge World or the New Plastic Serastus ones. In general, they tend to be a bit more plain and more Imperial focused, so if you want to make them a bit more chaos looking, then you might need to do a little conversion. Here we have one of their War Dog Small Knights. This one's a Stalker Pattern one, armed with a Chain Cannon and a Slaughter Claw. Quite a powerful threat to enemy tanks and heavy vehicles in combat, this one. Here we've got the Mecha Tendrilled Knight Abominant. The Knight's pilot is a Psyker and typically fights with Warp Storm Magic, and often has ravenous Terra Shade Birds swooping down from its hull. Otherwise, for the Loyalist kits, you can use the other ones, such as the Knight Tyrant. This is basically just the Dominus kit, but painted up for Chaos, or you could add some fun spikes and things from other Chaos kits. This one packs an enormous Harpoon and Flamestorm Cannon. And you can use the Horus Heresy equivalent knight, such as this Knight Lancer, or the same for the other Serastus chassis. Price-wise, again, I would rate the Chaos Knights as one of the cheaper armies to play as it goes in 40k. They don't have any discount bundles, but given that the majority of the army is carried by just two kits, if you have a few of these and magnetise them up, then you can quite easily fill just about any option that the faction has going for it, which is kind of nice. Perhaps one of the biggest limitations is that Games Workshop doesn't seem to be very good at keeping the War Dog kit in stock. It does have a tendency to go out of print with a slightly annoyingly regular basis. Rules-wise, Index Chaos Knights has some interesting core rules. They are perhaps the army in 40k that most plays around with the Battleshock type rules, so trying to make enemies fail morale tests, abandon objectives, and take other big penalties. The way they use that is Harbingers of Dread, which means that you have less leadership when you're nearby them. Their detachment rule means that you have to take tests even if you've taken some small amounts of casualties, and then from turn 3 onwards, if the enemy gets battle shocks, then it's both easier to kill them, and they're going to do less damage to your Chaos Knights, but that maybe does come a little bit later on in the game. Otherwise, as with the Imperial Knights, they do play a bit differently to most of the other armies of Warhammer 40k. They basically are an army entirely made of heavy vehicles with loads of raw power, and perhaps have a little bit more emphasis on melee combat compared with their Imperial cousins, which often enjoy heavy firepower, with things like the Knight Rampager and the War Dog Carnivore charging in for some bloody melee. As with the Imperials, the experience will be a bit different to many other Warhammer 40k forces. You are pretty much locked into fielding all vehicle skew lists, which can just not give you all the same experiences as a more balanced force might give you, so I would bear that in mind. Currently, with the balance of big knights to war dogs, the vast majority of their top tournament lists tend to be very heavy on war dogs, often just going nothing but those. But that's not to say that's guaranteed to continue in the future. Games Workshop do tend to change around points every so often. Currently, the Chaos Knights aren't doing too badly for in game power, though, largely carried by war dogs, but their win rate at tournaments does seem to be okay. I'd rank them as medium to strong in game at the moment, though I feel like a lot of their power doesn't necessarily come from their battle shock rules, which often tend to be just a little bit scattergun as to whether your opponent actually makes or fails key tests. In any case, if you want to play an army full of dread nobles and mighty vehicles with big firepower and massive melee, then the dread doom and despair of the Chaos Knights might be the army for you. Finally, for the three major facets of Warhammer 40k, we come to the Xenos. 
and we'll start with the space elf battle hosts that make up the Eldari, also known as the Azayani or the Craftworld Eldar. 40k's race of ancient, somewhat dying out elves, plying the void in their enormous craft world ships, the last remnants of their fallen civilization that was wiped out by the birth of the god of Slaanesh, created by the sheer depravity that their society had fallen into. The Eldari are a high-tech and advanced race, fighting from jet bikes and grav tanks with massively crafted technologies such as shuriken weapons and plasma star cannons, and many of their warriors dedicate themselves to learning the various aspects of Kane, their war god protector avatar shattered into shards during the fall. In battle they might be guided by their powerful psychic farseers, reading the fates to guide their war hosts to victory, and perhaps supported by their wraith host constructs, ghost warriors piloted by the soul of a fallen Eldar. Miniature-wise, the Eldari are one of 40k's most established factions, with miniatures that go back several decades now, they perhaps had some peak popularity and some of their biggest releases all the way back in the 90s, and despite multiple waves of updates since then, there's still miniatures that date back that far. Things like the old school warp spiders. Games Workshop did give them a pretty massive release of shiny new plastic kits in 2022, with things like the new avatar of Kane, Guardians, and plenty of other stuff that needed updating, but despite this, they probably still rank among one of the single oldest ranges in 40k. There's still a bunch of their aspect warriors that need updating, and the same for Phoenix Lords and things. For a few examples of their miniatures, here are the Guardian Defenders, the basic citizen soldiers of the Eldar, being the equal of trained militants of other factions, despite basically being a defence force made up of civilians essentially. They fight with the blade storm of the Shuriken Catapults. Aspect warriors are the more professional soldiers of the Eldari, dedicated to one aspect of their war god Kane striking scorpions, slinking through the shadows, and shredding enemy infantry formations with chainsaw and mander blaster, howling banshees striking swiftly with power swords while blasting the enemy with sonic screams that render them incapable of fighting back. At the heart of each craft world sits the avatar of Cain, a shard of the war god that can only be awoken by essentially blood sacrifice, but when roused is perhaps one of the scariest combatants in the galaxy, a mighty war god that's capable of laying low the best and brightest of the enemy foes. Supporting the war host, the Eldar make great use of grav tanks. The Falcon grav tank is perhaps one of the most recognisable, striking from the skies and delivering small squads of troops into battle, all while supporting with big firepower from its pulse laser. And the Eldar are also well known for their psychers, such as this Farseer. This one is a Skyrunner Farseer fielded on a jet bike, moving very rapidly around the battlefield to provide support where needed, and bearing a psychically attuned singing spear. As well as the more core Eldari range, there's also kind of the mini sub-ranges of Harlequins and Inari that we'll get onto in just a second. Price-wise, I'd say that the Eldari are perhaps medium to expensive in Warhammer terms. I feel like perhaps their lore being somewhat elite and not having many warriors to throw their lives away perhaps goes in with not having the most enormous army that you need to purchase out there, but still a lot of their specialists are kind of just like human-sized infantry. And from Games Workshop, they often tend to come at a bit of a premium. This is their combat patrol box with a Wraith Lord, some jet bikes, some Guardian Defenders and a Farseer. I think it's a pretty reasonable all-round box to start the faction. You could definitely get more than one set, though I feel like that might have you going a little bit heavy on the Windrider jet bikes. In game, since the start of 10th edition, Eldari have been pretty much without question the strongest army in the game, though there's no saying that that will continue to be the case in the future. Their core rules are pretty powerful though, and just allow you to translate a lot of dice into way more damage. Their strands of fate thing is kind of fun. At the start of the game, you basically act as a farseer, cast in the runes, and roll a whole load of dice. And then, kind of similar to the Sisters of Battle Miracle dice, you can then slot those dice into different dice rolls as the game goes on. So say if you desperately needed a 6 with a damage result, or a charge roll or something, then you could just pluck one out of the pool. Their battle host basically just means that they get way extra damage output as well. Every time a unit attacks, then you get to re-roll a hit roll and a wound roll, which is just spectacularly efficient with high power anti-tank weapons. Otherwise, for their unit choices, they tend to move as a fast-moving, hard-hitting force that is mostly fragile for the majority of their units, though there are certainly a few units that block that trend. The Wraith constructs tend to be slow and tanky, and the avatars both bring a whole load of raw might. In the supporting rules compared with most armies, the Eldari just have a whole load of movement tricks. Their units move quickly and then can often move at unusual times, like with Phantasm in the enemy turn. And this can be pretty devastating for enemy units trying to catch up with these fragile warriors and hit them back before they hide again. 
Overall, I'd say that their forces tend to be a little bit more ranged focused compared with melee, though it's not like they don't have combat units like, say, the Wraith Blades or the Avatars. Currently, at time of recording at least, they do seem to be the single strongest army in all of Warhammer 40k, not by as much as they were previously. But just in general over the years, the Eldar have tended to be one of the strongest factions in the game most of the time in 40k's history. Space Elf movement shenanigans and heavy firepower tend to be quite a good combo. In any case, if you want to collect some fast-moving, brightly coloured and technologically advanced Space Elf battle hosts, then the Eldari might be for you. Before we move on from Eldar properly, I thought it was worth just mentioning the sub-themes within the army. The Harlequins are now technically part of Codex Eldari, even if they had their own book in the past, and these are the enigmatic mass guardians of the Black Library, deep in the webway, seeking to protect it against any interlopers, and making war in a great choreographed performance of martial perfection, using hollow suits and flip belts to confound and confuse the foe as they dance through their ranks, dealing death at every turn. These enigmatic performers are often seen in alliance to both the Craft Worlds and the Drukhari. Even when they had their own book, their miniatures range was really quite small though, basically just three main kits in their standard troop, their Skyweaver jet bikes that you can see here, their skimmer transports and a few characters. For other miniatures, here's the sinister lurking death jester, dealing out death from afar with a shrieker cannon and potentially can snipe enemy heroes with that. And here's a fast moving void weaver support shooting vehicle armed with either a haywire cannon or a prismatic cannon for some anti-tank. Their vehicles tend to be protected from enemy return fire by invulnerable saves from their mirage launchers. In general I'd rank them price wise kind of similar to the Eldari. Their miniatures do generally tend to cost a fair few points but they don't really have any discount deals available to them so a sort of middling for 40k in general I'd argue. Rules wise the Harlequins do share their index with index Eldari so there's no real disadvantage to mixing and matching Harlequin units and Eldari units within the same force. I do kind of wonder whether they might get their own formation type thing when Codex Eldari does eventually come out. As a result, they do have some pretty excellent supporting rules with those battle host re-rolls and strands of fate type dice, though I would say that their unit pool isn't really quite as strong as the majority of Eldari units out there. They don't generally tend to be taken in top tournament lists quite as regularly as some, but I'd say they're far from unusable. For their playstyle, they tend to be particularly fast moving and often fighting from the backs of their Star Weaver transports to get them from A to B. Troops can jump out of those and hit the enemy hard with close range melee weapons and things like fusion pistols or haywire guns. Given that if you are playing pure Harlequins, though, you are leaving a whole load of the options of Codex Eldari on the table, they are a little bit medium to weaker if played alone, though the supporting rules of the Eldari still do them pretty good. In any case, if you want to collect an army of enigmatic space elf performers, then you could make a force of Harlequins for yourself, or even just include them as a section of force within either Eldari or a Drukhari army, where you can choose to take a quarter of your army as Harlequin units if you'd like to. Finally, for the other major theme within the Eldari Codex are the Inari. These guys are at least a somewhat recent Eldari lore innovation, going back around about seven years ago now. The Eldari death cult that worships Inead the god of the dead that the Eldar believe will eventually defeat the machinations of Slaanesh. As a result, they've grown as a cult following both within the Craftworld Eldar and the Drukhari, fighting as a great alliance of various different specialists, and led by leaders that epitomise death magic, reviving their warriors after they've been slain, or basically powering up and getting stronger, tougher and better reflexes from the soul bursts of their dying fellows. Lore wise I must admit I feel like Games Workshop perhaps created these guys and then just didn't really do all that much with them. The Inari don't really feel like they've been front and centre for the Eldari since they came out despite having multiple codexes out. Model wise within the Eldar codex they're represented by a trio of miniatures, if Rain as we just saw as the nominal leader of the faction, then there's the Incarn. The Avatar of Death, which is pretty monstrous, just jumping around the board and slaying enemies with, with some big melee and some swirling soulstorm energy. And then there's essentially Ivrain's bodyguard, the Vizark, a powerful combatant and champion of the faction. In game, playing Inari is basically playing Eldari with a twist. To access their rules at the moment, you have to take Ivrain as your warlord. And then if you do, you have certain options and restrictions in the army list. You can't take any Phoenix Lords or the Avatar of Cain, but you are allowed to include half your force as Drukhari, though again you're locked out of a few choices there like the Homunculus Covens. It means that you can create an interesting composite force by perhaps cherry picking some of the best units from Codex Eldari and Drukhari, and overall I would rank them as very strong, 
Plenty of competitive Eldari lists use the Incarn as it's very powerful, and some use Ivrain as the Warlords to access some Drukhari units. Big Lance shooting plus Battle Host rerolls is particularly nasty. Overall though, if you want an interesting composite force of all the different flavours of Space Elves put together with a Death Magic slant, then the Inari might be for you. Finally, for our last flavour of 40k Space Elves, we have the Darkkin, the Drukhari formerly known as the Dark Eldar, are basically the Eldar that caused the birth of Slaanesh in the first place, a depraved civilization that fell to all of its vices, but were able to hide from the fall deep within the webway in their nightmare city of Komara, a twisted abomination of black spires, rampant with gang warfare, gladiator cults, and torturer cults of pain that they drag their enslaved trophies of their raiding parties back to, as pain is what nourishes and sustains them, and allows them to be reborn in their homunculus covens. Generally, as the other forces of the galaxy vie for dominance or great ambitions of conquest, the Drukhari tend to make war only to steal and enslave, classically attacking the dead of night, fighting from the backs of their skimmer craft, such as raiders and venoms, blasting the enemy with lance fire, poison splinter weapons, and disgorging troops of shock gladiators into the enemy forces. Miniatures-wise, the Drukhari are unfortunately an army that is perhaps more in need of an update compared with virtually any force out there. Their miniature range is actually a fairly old one as it goes now, most of them dating from around about 13 to 15 years ago, but I feel like the majority of their sculpts hold up really quite well. The plastics that they have are quite nice. However, they're just notably missing a whole bunch of units from their roster, things that had fine cast kits that were kind of bad in their own way in one way or another anyway, things like grotesques, mandrakes, the court of the archon, or the beast packs, all of which could really do with an update. There's also miniatures that have been on the wish list for a very long time, such as a new and improved model for Astrobel Vex. For the miniatures that they do have on sale though, they're divided into the Cabals, Colts and Covens, basically the warrior gangs, which court gladiators, or the abominations of the flesh crafters. These are the Cabalite warriors, perhaps the most standard forces of the Drukhari, fighting with splinter weapons from the back of raiders most commonly. The Reaver jet bikes are members of the witch cult, fighting at enormous speeds and with the speed and dexterity to fly past an enemy unit and cut veins and exposed arteries with their blade veins on the sides of their vehicles. And here is one of the flesh abominations of the Homunculus Covens. This is a Talos pain engine, made from twist experimentations and muscles on flesh from the Drukhari's many captives, eerily floating across the battlefield and dealing out death and pain on all sides. Most of the Drukhari fight from their skimmer transports, of which the raider is perhaps the most iconic of them. Typically the army tends to fight as a mechanised force from transports like this. Raiders are very fast and can get their units to the front very quickly, and also pack a bit of firepower of their own, a fearsome Dark Lance or a Disintegrator. Money-wise, the Drukhari, again I'd say, are a fairly average Warhammer 40k army, not necessarily much better or worse than most. Their slightly older plastic range may be being a bit of an asset to them for miniature prices, as they generally tend to be a little bit cheaper than many of the squads would have been if Games Workshop just re-released them now. In particular, I would also say that they have a standard good combat patrol box set as well. This one comes with a fair bit of plastic with both a raider and the gun skiff ravager, some cabalite warriors, an archon and a squad of the sinister incubi, some of their most recent models, and you could easily pick up a couple of copies of this if you were starting the faction. In game, the Drukhari are built around a power from pain mechanic that I think is generally quite fluffy and evocative of what they want to do in the lore. If they destroy enemies or make them despair and fail battleshock tests, then you gain a pain token, and then you can use those pain tokens to either make your units faster or just deal way more damage in shooting or the fight phase. Kind of feels all very appropriate, the Drukhari feeding off the pain they inflict to commit yet more atrocities. Given their unit pool and options, they tend to be very fast-moving, hard-hitting, and more fragile than most armies out there. The Homunculus Covens give them access to at least some slightly durable units, though aside from maybe the Kronos, most of them aren't standout tough still for the points cost. Currently in game though, a lot of Drukhari players aren't particularly happy with the way that their codex is structured. There's just quite a lot of keyword weaknesses in 10th edition that they got taken down from 9th. Fly units just aren't quite as powerful, and units embarked within transports can't use the majority of their special rules. And just within the unit balance of the codex itself, generally the things that have the dark lances or the other dark light weapons tend to be the things to go for. A lot of their melee stuff seems a little bit disappointingly underpowered. 
It might not necessarily be all bad news though, given that they're almost guaranteed to get some nice army buffs in the next balanced data slate as a result. Seems likely that things will swing back in their favour later in the edition. In any case, if you want to collect one of the most all-around evil factions in Warhammer 40k, a whole bunch of savage murderers and torturers fighting for the backs of Arrow Swift raiding craft, then perhaps the Drukhari might be for you. Moving on to some more radically alien Xenos, next up we have the Tyranids, brought fully into the limelight as the focal faction of 10th edition 40k once more. These are the alien horrors from beyond the galaxy, seemingly closing in from all sides in their vast alien hive fleets, attacking planets with countless waves of biohorrors of all shapes and sizes, stripping the world bare and devouring them to produce more bioentities, and then continuing onwards in their path to consume the entire galaxy. Tyranids are perhaps one of the greatest eldritch horrors of Warhammer 40k. No one knows how many there are out there, and with each conflict and confrontation, they seem to be more powerful and adapt to fighting their foes. The great hive mind constantly innovating, countering enemy tactics, and deploying swarms that coordinate assaults from the ground, air, and tunneling. Vast synaptic leader beasts like this hive tyrant direct lesser forms of organisms into battle, and the shadow in the warp drives enemy troopers mad and cuts enemy psychers off from communication with the Empyrean. As mentioned, the Tyranids have been receiving a lot of love in early 40k 10th edition. They are the focal antagonist faction, much as Necrons were before and Death Guard before that, and that's given them a rather enormous model release, which to be fair to them, I think they did kind of sorely need. There were a lot of aging miniatures in their range that just didn't really keep up with Games Workshop's other current plastics. As a result, I feel like their miniature range is now in really quite a good shape. They've got lots of unit options of Tyranids, both smaller hordes, bigger monsters, and anything in between, and the vast majority of the oldest and slightly more annoying kits have been updated now. For a few examples of their army, here are the Swarmy Termagants, pretty much the basic attrition warfare foot troopers of the high fleets, swarming across the battlefield armed with flesh borers or devourers, shooting living ammunition into the enemy ranks. For one example of a big monstrous creature, here is the Tyranifex, this one basically equivalent to a big walking living battle tank, carrying an enormous gun such as the rupture cannon here to devastate enemy tanks. The Tyranids also employ lots of infiltration and disruption type organisms such as Lictors, chameleonic skin blending in with the battlefield's environment to leap out and ambush their foes unawares. This one is the particularly fearsome and terrifying version, the Death Leaper. As well as that, the Tyranids have some awesome psychic might of themselves. Zoanthropes or Neurotyrants can lay waste to enemy forces with little more than the powers of their minds. They're borne aloft by their own psychic energies and floats mysteriously towards the foe enemy bullets being deflected by their psychic shielding. Price-wise, again, I'd rank the Tyranids as a kind of medium price faction in Warhammer 40k. A good range of miniatures and maybe aren't enormously standout, either cost-effective nor standout pricey. 10th edition should hopefully yield a fair few options with cheaper kits for them. It's currently quite easy to pick up most options from the Leviathan box set second-hand right now, and they do have some pretty excellent starter kits. Say for example, this is the Tyranids half of the ultimate starter set for Warhammer 40k. Either this or the regular one can be a very cheap and easy way to get into the faction, particularly if you can find someone to split the box with with the Space Marine half. There's also the Christmas Battle Force box set, the Onslaught Swarm, if you can find that about anywhere. And there's at least a reasonable chance that there might be a Hachette Parkworks magazine coming out for the Tyranids at some stage. That happened with both the Death Guard and the Necrons in years before, so it seems kind of likely that we might get one later in the edition, which might yield some other good discount for the bugs. Gameplay-wise, the core rules of the Tyranids are the Shadow in the Warp and their Synapse rules. Shadow in the Warp now manifests itself in a army-wide battle shock for a turn, which could be kind of disruptive and stop the enemies scoring from time to time, though it's a little bit random as to whether the opponent rolls well on key units or not. Their synapse rules I think are quite evocative for the way that their synaptic organisms command their lesser swarms, if you can take down the big bugs, as while they're under their control they're very unlikely to fail leadership, whereas if their directing bugs are gone then they're far less reliable on objectives. Tyranids are one of the few armies with their codex out now, and that means that they have more ways to play the army compared with most at the moment. They've got six different detachments here, Crusher Stampede for monsters, Vanguard Onslaught for infiltration organisms, Unending Swarm for carpets of gaunts, Assimilation Swarm for devouring monsters healing up their nearby foes, Synaptic Nexus maybe focusing primarily on leader bugs, 
an invasion fleet being a nice balanced swarm with some fun adaptive traits to tailor your damage output to the foe in hand to represent the Tyranids mutating and sending in specialised organisms. I feel like Games Workshop has perhaps done surprisingly well to make quite a lot of these viable. In competitive play, the ones that are seen the most are the Vanguard Onslaught, the Unending Swarm, Synaptic Nexus and Invasion Fleet, all of which generally are getting played and have done well in big events. Otherwise, playstyle-wise, they do have access to a lot of different units. You can play very hordy with them, or you can play a more Nidzilla sort of monster sort of focus. And even though they might have been traditionally thought of as a bit more of a melee faction in the past, I'm not really so sure that's the case anymore. Between a whole load of biocannon shooting and other psyche attacks with units like zone throbes, you certainly can make armies that build heavily around melee or heavily around range. In game, perhaps one of their weaknesses might be struggling to deal with the biggest and toughest data sheets that the enemy has. They can match up quite poorly against things like knights. Overall, I'd say they're in not too bad a place in Warhammer 40k in general. Probably fairly mid tier in terms of power, but with lots of variable playstyles and some pretty good supporting units like Lictors for hoovering up victory points. I feel like maybe a few of their units could afford some points drops or rules boosts, though. In any case, if you want to collect an all consuming swarm to devour the galaxy, and crush the enemy under waves of gaunts or massive monsters, the Tyranids might be for you. Also within the force of the hive mind though are a far more insidious threat, often preceding a Tyranid invasion are a cult of mutants and monsters uprising from the deeper echelons of a planet. The Imperium might think that a world is safe and well defended, but little do they know that it's secretly enthralled to a gene stealer cult already. Gene stealer cults are created when a patriarch broodlord variant makes planet fall, and psychically corrupts and mutates the humans near it, forming a clandestine secret organisation that spreads its way throughout the planet, secretly diverting weapons and supplies until the day of uprising and ascension arrives, fighting off the imperial oppressors to ascend to their star gods, and whatever the oncoming tyranids might bring. The forces of the Genestealer cults might be surprisingly numerous, and tend to make use of looted ad hoc weaponry, often diverted from mining supplies like heavy mining lasers and caches of demolition charges, brought to bear on the foes from unexpected angles. Miniatures wise, the Genestealer cults were once a classic 40k army from ages past, now have an entirely new range of miniatures that haven't really been around for too long as 40k's history goes. Now they've been built up to what I'd say is a fairly medium sized range, a fair few options for infantry, bikes and vehicles, plus a fairly big cast of characters. Plus their rules allow them to make use of Astra Militar and Brood Brother allies, so they can corrupt some planetary defence forces with some big tanks to aid their fight if needed. Some of their basic and most combat focused troopers are the Acolyte hybrids, tending to bring to bear heavy mining weapons like this rock saw or the demo charges that the one on the back has, quite big for taking down the enemy's strongest war machines. Here is the Blessed Patriarch flanked by his brood coven of a Primus and a Magus, high leaders within the cult and often found directing squads around. Here's a looted mining vehicle, the Goliath Rock Grinder. This one is charged into battle with its drill dozer blades being used and are very effective against taking down enemy infantry. This one's also armed with a purging clearance incinerator as well, a pretty fearsome flamethrower weapon. Otherwise they do have a lot of different characters to fall back on. This guy the Kelomorph I think is a particularly fun model within the range, basically a gunslinger who's got three arms, so of course he has three pistols to lay low the enemy's leaders and characters with. Price-wise, the Gene Stealer Colts army is generally famously expensive, aside from perhaps their combat patrol box, which admittedly I'd say is very good and definitely takes the edge off. Again, I'd rank this as one of the single best combat patrol box sets in Warhammer 40k. It contains around about half the plastic kits in the faction, and it's definitely one that you could get multiple copies of. A good amount of neophytes, plus some aberrants, acolytes, the rock grinder, and a major leader. If this box set didn't exist, I'd certainly rank them as one of the most expensive armies in the game, though at least they perhaps run a little bit less hoardy than they used to in the past. I feel like Games Workshop's Colt Ambush Respawn mechanic is actually kind of clever for that, as it means that you often get to use the same models more than once per game, rather than just dying and then have them go away. Speaking of which, I feel like the Gene Stiller Colt Index rules are really quite fun ones. They basically play it as Guerrilla Warfare the Army. Most of the normal units besides a couple of the vehicles can either infiltrate, deep strike or scout and then when most of the infantry type units are slain they have the chance to go back into reserve as basically a new copy of the unit though it's a bit of a random chance and a little bit more likely if it's either early in the game that they're killed or it's some of their battle line troops like acolytes or neophytes. 
It means that you can potentially have an Alpha Strike unit hit the enemy very hard, get wiped out in return, and then come back for a second go later in the game with a system of blip tokens that the opponent can then try and neutralise if possible. Their detachment benefit also gives them an extra damage boost when they come out of reserve as well, which really plays into their core mechanic. Otherwise, their units generally tend to be hard-hitting after they come out of the reserve ambush, with big things like neophyte seismic cannon blocks or acolytes throwing demo charges everywhere, and they have some fun and powerful stratagems with things like dropping just outside of 3 inches of enemy units, returning to reserve, or stopping the enemy from shooting one key unit this turn. Generally, their individual damage profiles on their weapons don't tend to be super standout, but between a whole load of powerful boosts to their shooting, they can make them hit very hard. Currently they maybe tend to play a bit more as a ranged army as opposed to a dedicated close combat army, though they certainly have plenty of fairly savage melee units if you do want to go that way. Overall for in-game power, it would rank them as kind of medium to strong at the moment. They did take some heavy nerfs to the cult ambush mechanic and also some points cost early in the edition, and now I'd say they're in a fairly good place. I definitely feel like some of the units are much more standout than others in the index though. In any case, if you want to throw off the oppressors with a wave of mutant alien uprisings, then perhaps the Gene Stealer Cult are for you. Speaking of armies that have returned from 40k's distant past, next up we have the Leagues of Votan. These are another very recent faction within Warhammer 40k, around about a year old at time of recording now. And these are essentially the old squats reborn in a new form, a race of clone space dwarves that inhabit the galactic core, using their powerful Votan ancestor cores to answer a whole load of their questions of society with artificial intelligence logic, and typically they fight and skirmish to enhance the prospects of their leagues, making war to take resources, expand territory, and fight against the other factions of the Warhammer 40k galaxy that might seek to encroach on their domain. Their war gear and technology generally tend to be versions of Imperial tech that have diverged in the distant past. While the Imperium has largely stagnated, they have continued to engineer and improve designs, so a lot of their weapons tend to be slightly opgoned versions of their Imperial counterparts. Miniatures-wise, they've got a small model range that hails from late 2022. For a completely new faction, I feel like their model choice isn't truly terrible. They've got several infantry units, some bikes, two vehicles, and four characters. I think it's highly likely that they get more with the 10th edition codex and expect another major release wave for them then. Their style of army seems to be maybe some slightly generically sci-fi feeling, spacesuits and moon boggy type things, with a few slightly subtler nods to their dwarven heritage, things like totem poles and some inlaid gold bits on certain miniatures. These are the basic battle line troops of the faction, the Hearthkin Warriors, generally armed with ion blasters or autoc bolters, and a few special weapons like the Magna Rail Rifle that you can see on the back right. Here's their big vehicle, basically the Land Raider sort of equivalent Hecaton Land Fortress. It sports some Perspex windows, a bunch of bolt cannons, and then a powerful conversion beamer or big railgun on the top. These things are both big transports and also big damage dealers in their own right. For their character miniatures, here's the Grimnir, a bit of a throwback to the living ancestor of the Squats of old. He's the Psyker for the faction, making his unit tougher and dealing out some damage to enemies, and he's accompanied by his robot corves with some auxiliary bolter fire. Finally, for some elites of the faction, here are the Exo-Armoured Votan Ironhair Hearthguard, essentially Votan Terminators pretty much, heavily armoured elites with some fair focus on both range and melee damage, shooting with some powerful Vulcanite blasters or plasma weapons. Price-wise at the moment, the Leagues of Votan are kind of expensive to get a full 2,000 point army on the board, but that's perhaps partly just due to Games Workshop having massively cranked the points down on most of their units. They basically gave them some really quite underbaked rules when 10th edition came out, making them the single weakest faction in the game, and compensated for that by making them really quite cheap to field. I feel like their combat patrol is a reasonable enough balanced introduction to the faction. Some Chthonian Berserks and some Hearthkin Infantry, all led by a Karl, their signature leader for the faction. In game, their signature rule is Eye of the Ancestors, which is their judgement tokens. As the Leagues of Votan get more and more angry at certain units on the board, they get better at destroying them. Judgement tokens can be handed out by the Detachment Special Rule, also by the Karl Leader. And perhaps most evocatively, when you destroy a Votan unit, your unit gains a judgement token, so the Leagues of Votan get better at punching back. Particularly with their detachment advantage, it means that they can hand out a whole bunch of judgments right from the start of the game, and be plus one to hit and wound quite a lot of important stuff in the opponent's army. For playstyle, their army generally tends to most focus around close range shooting as opposed to melee. 
The faction weaknesses, they do tend to be a bit short-ranged, and their basic foot troops tend to be kind of slow. The things like Sagittaurs and their bikes definitely buck that trend. Several of their units have some pretty savage close-range firepower, such as the Brock here Thunderkin, like this guy, particularly armed with Grav Cannons. Currently in 40k, they are one of the stronger factions in the game now. Fairly easy to use, with a bunch of pretty dangerous firepower. Sagittaur Transports, Grav Thunderkin, and Iron Here Hearthcard all tend to be staples in competitive lists. Overall though, if you want to run a race of clone space dwarves in Warhammer 40k with some powerful weaponry, then the Leagues of Votan might be for you. From 40k's newest faction to one of the most established out there, next up we come to the violent green-skinned barbarians that are the Orcs, a race of fungoid aliens that grow from spores, and when grown to maturity, like nothing more than to grab a slugger and chopper and make war for the sheer joy of it, liking nothing more than to charge enemy lines and break some heads with some powerful melee weapons. Mighty war bosses might inspire entire planets worth of greenskins to embark on great war, holy crusade migration type things, rampaging across the galaxy and stomping the other races flat beneath their feet. It's often said that if the orcs ever banded together, the rest of the races in Warhammer 40k wouldn't have a chance, but in reality that's never likely to happen due to constant infighting, the greenskins often taking their violence out on each other just as much as anyone else. In combat, their mechs will generally stitch together whatever looted material they have at hand, cobbling together great war machines, walkers and trucks out of scrap, and then throwing them at the enemy alongside the rest of their forces. They may often make war alongside great beasts as well, squid cavalry and kill rigs marching alongside. The Orc clans all have their own personality and different traits as well, as per the rest of the thing, there's no real in-game rules differences besides the models that you choose to field, but there are more just variations for theme. There's the looting death skulls that like to steal things and cobble it together with some big great mech guns, the savage snake bites who like the old ways and believe that over-reliance on technology is fundamentally unorky, the mighty goths, perhaps the most standard clan, who believe might is right and everything else is just mucking around, they're some of the most savage melee combatants out of any of the orcs, though all of them are good at that. And otherwise, the piratical freebooters, the rich bad moons with their liking for fancy gear and have lots of teeth, the lightning fast evil sun speed freaks, and the sneaky gits of the commando blood axes with a liking for camouflage and overly elaborate battle plans. Miniatures wise, the orcs have one of the bigger and most established ranges of the game. And generally their army I think is quite nicely done, with a lot of their miniatures having been updated sort of recently. A big model wave release in 9th edition updated a few of the things that needed it most, like the commandos. The orcs definitely have some distinct sub-themes within their army, like the more recent Beast Snaggers, Games Workshop, reimagining the whole Savage Orc aesthetic. Or the Speed Freak orcs that are sort of Mad Max style orcs with a whole bunch of bikes and buggies and race cars, zooming towards the enemy at breakneck pace and firing off a whole load of guns at them. The heart of most armies will be the Orc Boys, as you can see here. Your standard gits armed with either shooters or sluggers and choppers, simple, violent and effective, and often making war in big hordes. The Death Dread is the orky version of a Dreadnought, one Orc being permanently wired in this mechanical shell and stomping forward in rage to tear the enemy apart with great big claws and swords. Here are some of the Beast Snaggers with the Squig Hog Boys. I do quite like these miniatures and I think they're quite fun riding squid cavalry into battle with some Gretchen hangers on. Here's a Speed Freak shock drum dragster, a race car with some saw blades on the front, and a great big custom shock rifle to lay enemy elites low. And finally here's the big boss of them all, Gasgore Thracker, the mightiest greenskin warlord in the 40k setting, and famous for creating pretty much endless war on the planet of Armageddon, a vital manufacturing and pivotal world for the Imperium in that sector. He also comes with Makari, his trusty banner waver. Price wise, the Orcs are one of the more expensive armies to collect in Warhammer 40k. As per their law, most of their units just don't really tend to be very elite, so you typically need quite a few of them on the board. Fighting in hordes and armed with scrap weapons, I guess, does take its toll a little bit there. They have been in an established range for a while now, and Orcs, perhaps more than any other faction, really lend themselves to conversions and things, so you can potentially make some units out of scraps if you want to. That is indeed actively encouraged by other Orc hobbyists. The combat patrol box for the Orcs I think is nice enough. 20 boys, a Death Dread, some Death Copters and a War Boss. All fairly nice miniatures I think, though I do think that the boys squad is just a little bit unfortunate. They made the sculpts kind of nice, but didn't give them the weapon options of the standard set, which is a bit annoying. Rules wise, the core faction rules for the Orcs really favour melee combat all the way. Their primary rule is calling the War for a turn. 
The warboss lets out a bellowing cry, and orcs across the battlefield surge forward, getting all sorts of benefits between advance and charge, plus one to their strength and attacks, and the harder to take out with a 5 plus and vulnerable save. That is going to give you a pretty devastating turn of melee combat, and the detachment rule takes the melee even further with exploding sixes to hit. As a result, and perhaps unsurprisingly, orcs generally tend to favour aggressive melee rush armies, generally putting loads of pressure on the opponents and catching them up with howling greenskin violence. They often tend to make good use of transports like trucks or maybe battle wagons to get them on their way. There are plenty of other army archetypes that you can play greenskins with though. People quite like their dread mobs with a bunch of walkers like this Gorkinort or the Jeff Dreads or Killer Cans. Or you could try and build yourself a speed war with a bunch of the custom buggies, bikes and death copters and things hurtling towards the foe to get the job done fast. Unfortunately, at the moment at least, Games Workshop haven't really created very good internal balance within the Orky Codex, where basically the vast majority of the things with guns are just a bit underpowered now. That perhaps partly might be due to just not having many rules that support shooting armies, which hopefully will materialise with the new Orc Codex in Spring 24. Overall, they are currently really quite a strong army in-game though, a challenge to deal with with lots of factions when played in their strongest form pleasing Gork and Mork across the battlefields of many tournaments, with melee rushes delivering victory. Overall, if you want to play a violent and all-around fun faction, then the Orcs might well be for you. In general, Orky players tend to have a reputation for a good attitude to the game, lots of good violence and having a laugh, perhaps one of the factions of the game that takes the setting remarkably less seriously. Moving on from the Orcs, we have the living metal phalanxes of the mysterious Necrons, a deathless race of robot skeletons pretty much, arising from their tomb worlds to reclaim their empire of old. In the distant past, in the war in heaven, their flesh was replaced by living metal, in a treacherous deal by their star gods that they then broke and enslaved, though that was far too late to save them from the soulless horrors that they've become today. In recent years in the galaxy, the Necrons have begun to reawaken in their tomb worlds. Planets that have been inhabited by other races for millennia suddenly realise that they're sharing the planet with legions of dangerous Necron armies, who are none too happy to have their worlds inhabited by interlopers on their reawakening. In battle, they tend to fight with phalanxes of Necrons with Gauss weapons, weapons that enough firepower can cut through anything, dissolving their foes at a molecular level, and their sinister living metal constructions give them enormous powers of regeneration. It's not uncommon for enemy soldiers to destroy an entire unit of Necrons, only to have them rise from the dead once more. Their frames just re-knitting themselves to weather even the most grievous of damage. The Necrons had a rather extensive range refresh in 9th edition 40k. They had a lot of re-sculpted kits, lots of reimagined units and plenty of new stuff added in as well. Plenty of sinister squads and they do have some big subtypes within their army that destroy cults that modify their bodies to become living weapons or various canoptic automata type units under the thrall of their cryptic tech support units. These are perhaps the most iconic Necrons in the galaxy, the Necron Warriors, stalking forward armed with their Gauss Reapers and Flayers. They're perhaps particularly known for their powers of regeneration, destroy half a squad, and you can have most of it just come straight back next turn. One of their most iconic vehicles is the Mighty Monolith, an obsidian space pyramid, blasting out rays of particle death on all sides, and it has an eternity gate on it, where more Necron Warriors can march onto the board or teleport units back to it. For an example of the destroyers, here are the Aphidian destroyers, born aloft on whip coil tails and armed with some big hyperphase blades. These can burrow beneath the ground and strike the foe at unexpected angles. Destroyers in general just yearn for the destruction of all living things. Here's an example of one of their Canoptic constructs in the Canoptic Doomstalker. This one mounts the enormous Death Ray anti tank cannon, perhaps most powerful as static fire support to take down the enemy heavy hitters out there. And also they can muster some enslaved star gods amongst their ranks. This is a Catan Shard of the Void Dragon, an eldritch horror that affects technology and vehicles, borne aloft on crackling eldritch energy, and a really quite cool centrepiece for the army, I think. Price-wise, Necrons tend to be at least fairly elite, and overall I'd say that they have kind of middling value within Warhammer 40k price-wise. It was definitely a lot better in 9th edition when they had multiple starter sets and other discount boxes on offer, at the moment they don't have anything, though they should be getting this Combat Patrol box set, which should come out alongside their codex in the not too distant future. In game, rules wise, perhaps their biggest feature are their reanimation protocols. If you leave an enemy Necron unit half destroyed, it will gradually heal health until it's back to full health once more. Healing D3 wounds per turn, and potentially lots of ways to make that even better with things like resurrection orbs in the unit, canoptic reanimators, stratagems and more. 
Their index detachment places a big emphasis on characters as well. Their units get a lot better and more threatening if there is a character in the squad. Their main playstyle does generally tend to revolve around the reanimation protocols quite a bit. Units generally repair and tank damage quite well. And a lot of Necron forces tend to build around big blocks of either Lich Guard or Warriors, supported by things like Canoptec Reanimators, Resurrection Orbs, or Cryptex for extra durability and further healing. They've got quite a lot of options for damage dealing, some high-power long-ranged anti-tank weapons, plenty of closer range shooting with their Gauss stuff, and a good few dedicated melee units as well. In general, they tend to be a slight bit more of an attrition warfare type army though. Most of their damage output isn't truly spectacular, and tend to be more trying to deal a fair bit of damage while just shrugging off the enemy's shots. Currently at time of recording, they're perhaps slightly middling to weaker in Warhammer 40k. Some of their best combos went up in points a bit. The things like their durable Lich Guard blocks can still be a massive challenge to deal with, and unless you can bring to bear enormous amounts of focal damage on them, they're quite likely to survive the game no matter what you do to them. In any case, if you'd like to command a deathless race of robot skeletons, where even the casualties that the enemy puts on your units can just stand back up again, then maybe the Necrons are for you. Finally, for our journey through the many many races of Warhammer 40k, we come to the Tau Empire. The Tau are perhaps a bit of an antithesis to much of the rest of the 40k setting, being a young, innovative and expansionist race, bringing to bear new developments and technology, often with some very fancy manga-esque battlesuits, on a galaxy of ancient eldritch horrors and well-established empires. The Tau Empire vaguely Japanese and themed with a caste system of the earth, water, air and fire caste, the fire caste being their military, and generally tend to make war with ranged mobile warfare with heavy guns laying the foe low and focusing on destroying the foe as opposed to holding arbitrary ground like other races might favour, or maybe not as it seems behind the outwardly positive outlook of the Tau Empire though, the shadowy commands of the Ethereals are pretty much authoritarian law to them, and even the breakaway renegade commander Farsight, who is trying to defy the Ethereals, seems to be struggling with his own issues and preventing himself from falling to corn. Miniatures-wise, the Tower range is actually probably one of the medium to older ranged armies in Warhammer 40k on average for their kits. Some of the core units of the faction have been re-sculpted recently, but a few things do date from quite a while back, though I think that in general their sleek and futurish aesthetic has generally aged quite well. They have a limited amount of foot troops, but much of the army is battlesuit pilots of one sort or another, other stealth ones, crisis battlesuits, as perhaps their most iconic unit as you can see here, or bigger ones like the Riptide or Ghost Kill. We know that they've got a codex coming in 2024 with at least one miniature in a Krutox rider coming out. Hopefully they might get a little bit more love beyond that as well. Otherwise, take a look at a few more miniatures. These are their standard Fire Warrior Strike teams, armed with pulse rifles or pulse carbines. They're the basic foot troopers of the Tau Empire and have perhaps some of the most punchy small arms of most troops in the galaxy. Here's the mighty railgun of the Hammerhead gunship, a much feared weapon amongst Imperial tank commanders. A single shot can be more than enough to destroy just about any tank that it focuses on if it manages a direct hit. And then for commanders, here's the renegade commander Farsight, who's the newest miniature for the faction at time of recording. Perhaps channeling a little bit of Japanese samurai sort of energy there, particularly with the blossomed tree on his base. And he's one of the only Tau units that can fight in melee with his sword, the Dawnblade. Price-wise, I perhaps previously would have said that the Tau Empire were a fairly medium sort of price faction, though Games Workshop have recently put down the points costs on most of their units, and in general again that means that if you want to collect an army of any given size, it will cost you more. I feel like their combat patrol is useful enough, you get an ethereal or some fire warriors, stealth suits, a fire blade, and a ghost kill suit. I'd say they're generally all useful enough units to have in your army. Maybe feels like a box set that doesn't really go very heavy on the actual damage dealers of the faction though. You probably want to expand to things like crisis suits or things with bigger guns to support all this. Currently their rules are via their digital index, though their codex is coming out in spring 2024, not so long away there. And their core faction mechanic is the coordinated firepower they get from the greater good special rule. The idea is that their units work in pairs, ideally with marker light units spotting for other units in their army giving them an extra plus one to hit, and also ignoring cover if they have the marker keyword. Their other major rule currently is the Cao Yon special rule, one of their two major fighting styles and ways of war. The patient hunter gets the prey, and basically if they can deny gratification for a couple of battle rounds, then from battle round three onwards they get some seriously scary shooting damage boosts, with sustained hits one or sustained hits two on all their weapons. 
Playstyle-wise, the Tau tend to be almost exclusively ranged warfare, tending to be fairly mobile off battlesuits, zooming around the table with the fly keyword, and potentially jump shoot jumping with one of their stratagems, ghosting in and out of cover so they can hit the enemy and run away before they strike back. Currently I feel like their codex is pretty well internally balanced. Generally you need a few big firepower damage dealers, but most of the rest of the codex is pretty usable beyond that, interesting lone operatives, cheap expendable alien auxiliaries, and some fun stealth suit type options. Most models seem pretty reasonable to put on the board in competitive lists. Currently for in-game power, they're pretty strong as well. Crisis suits in particular with Psychic Ion Blasters are enormous damage dealers, though they are perhaps an army that tends to excel a little bit better in the hands of really experienced players. It can be a bit of a trade-off between trying to deal damage early and score early objectives, while not exposing your ranged units to too much enemy retribution by pushing them up the board too much. They don't enjoy being in combat, and they don't tend to have the best durability for factions out there in 40k. In any case, if you want a technologically advanced and highly manoeuvrable gun line of an army, laying the foe low from afar with plasma weapons and ion guns, then maybe the Tau Empire's battlesuit forces are for you. In any case, with the Xenos talked about, that's just about every faction in Warhammer 40k, and a brief overview of what they are and what they might do in-game. Let me know which faction is your favourite in the game at the moment, look forward to hearing all your thoughts down in the comments below. And for those of you who have been collecting armies, why should people collect your faction, or maybe think about avoiding it, depending on your own experiences. Otherwise, if you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. If you'd like a bit more of a deep dive into a few of the stronger armies in the game, and what makes them good at the moment, then I'll leave a link to my top 10 current strongest armies of Warhammer 40k video down in the video description. Feel free to check that out if you'd like to watch something else next. Finally, if you got some good value out of the video and would like to keep big projects like this coming, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming. Making enormous videos like this does take a lot of time and effort, so if you are enjoying it, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.